So, I haven't quite thought that through, but I think they're gonna be like, Hey, what is up, guys? It's the AI Wizards show part one, and I have a very, very cool guy here. It's Carlo Lapelers, right? Hey. Lapelers, yes. Yeah, yeah. Carlo Lapelers. Labelers. Listen to his pronunciation, don't listen to me. <laughs> I know <laughs> nothing here. So, 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 man, like, I mean, let's just jump right, right into it. Like, what yeah. gets you excited about AI? What, what gets you going? What gets me going? Now, my initial inspiration to uh, dive into AI was uh, artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And specifically the work that... Uh, Ben Gertzel is doing. Did you ever heard uh, of him? Uh, I, I think I've heard. Uh, it's about neural link and um, singular, singularity, all that. Yeah, the singularity net. He's uh, working yeah, yeah, on yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember yeah. You, told, you told me about it. Yeah, it was a while ago. And he uh, worked with uh, Hanson Robotics on uh, Sophia, the robot, yeah. like a humanoid uh, robot. Yeah, I saw and, your, uh, your tweet, you saw her life, right? Yeah. Lately, yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We can talk. About it yeah, later. sure. I think we'll get to that. So keep going. So uh, yeah, at that time I was uh, pursuing a career as a professional drummer. Okay. And I still think uh, music is very, uh, yeah, very powerful and can have a yeah, very large yeah. impact on people. But um, yeah, I saw like uh, I was diving into this AI stuff and uh, AGI stuff, and I thought like, wow this is really powerful this can really be uh, big so and then i decided to uh, dive into that and uh, also do a formal uh, formal bachelor university uh, program on data science okay so that's what initially got me going like uh, a year year ago now so, so uh, how long was that was that like before you got excited about uh, ai and like to that moment that you decided to actually like, enroll in, in a university or like start you know really seriously pursuing like i don't know online courses or you know what's like your what are your sources of learning about like how, how long did it took for you to say like hmm like i want to really be into it like i'm ready to take that seriously um yeah so i started first watching uh, youtube videos of uh, sophia and uh, ben gertzel's uh, work and um, then, uh, yeah, I didn't know how to code, so I uh, I knew that I had to learn some uh, some Python or some high level language to get started. So I started at uh, Code Academy, just learning basic uh, Python syntax. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I literally bought uh, data science for dummies and machine learning for dummies. Oh, yeah, like <laughs> these books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just started reading through, through them and like working with uh, Jupyter notebooks and machine learning algorithms. And uh, yeah, shortly after that, I uh, a, 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 and how how long how long ago was that? Uh, it was in the beginning of this year, like in January. Oh, uh, it, it's about the time I've, I've actually started to get into all that stuff too. I mean, I mean. Oh. I mean, did you know how to code? What? Oh, I mean, did you know how to code before you d dove into AI? Uh, w uh, could you repeat? Uh... Did you already know how to code before you uh, got into AI? I, I actually was doing like I actually like I learned how to code maybe in January or to like February, and then no. I, I've learned how, how to code in Python, and then I was like listening to some podcast, some podcast, and they were mentioning like data science and AI. I've started like googling around, found you know Saraj's videos. I got excited, and you know then I began to like you know. I, so yeah, I knew how, how to code before, but it was like a really quick transition. So I kind of learned how to code. In Python, like the basic syntax, and then really went uh, quickly into figuring out like what what are the ways to do cool things with AI. Okay, so you already knew syntax, but you had to learn like other libraries. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> including some math and like, <laughs> I was actually surprised how much uh, of like the basic math can you learn from YouTube. YouTube's awesome. Yeah, YouTube <laughs> really. Yeah. It's really remarkable how uh, you can, how much is for free nowadays to uh, learning material. I'm gonna raise my cup. I'm gonna raise my cup too, actually. So <laughs> let's drink some water <laughs> for a good episode. <laughs> episode. <laughs> what can be better than water? Coffee. Ah, oh, you're drinking coffee. I'm drinking both, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh... th th that's a good tip. I'm afraid that if I was drinking now coffee, I would, like wouldn't go to be uh, go to sleep for like another seven hours, and yeah, th that's not what I want for today. Maybe later. Can at night? Huh? What? You can handle coffee at night? Yeah, <laughs> I, I I I get all the like uh, fired up and excited and can sleep basically. So I'm 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 doing coffee in the, in the mornings and like that sort of thing. Cool. So, what? so it's been, so you've been, I mean, when, so it's like this January of this year, you mean, you started like the whole journey into, yeah, okay, yeah. and this, uh, this January, yeah, around January, oh, okay, <laughs> and when did you enroll in the university, also around that time? Um, yeah, around that time, but the bachelor program uh, started in uh, September. Okay. But, but okay. the thing is, so you kind of so you kind of hopped on that train a little later. Uh, yeah. Okay. Bachelor program started uh, late, but I had to learn um, like another mathematics, uh, mathematic B. They call it yeah. in the Netherlands, as I didn't have that in high school, so it was actually. Uh, Mm -hmm. I started with that in uh, yeah in January. And, and, and so, how much do you feel you've like pro pro progressed over that time? Like you've probably learned a lot of things. Um, like do, yeah. like yeah, a lot, a lot of things. A lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, like um, uh, before I got started in I was I was studying. Uh, commercial economics in the entertainment industry and basically like, just playing uh, live shows every week mm -hmm. and uh, when I got started in AI I quitted my uh, my band and my previous uh, study so I basically had a year uh, between so I had a, mm -hmm. also had a lot of time to uh, study. So you were studying economics and doing drums right? Yes. Okay, economics in the entertainment industry, so more like marketing and uh, ah, okay. yeah, organizing events and that kind of stuff. So, so but but you um, have you worked in that industry or did you did you like you know went into or like or like were doing drums and kind of studying and then you like went straight to AI? like like did like did you get the experience of working in entertainment economics or was it like something else? Um, yeah, I worked in as a professional drummer for around uh, three years in mm -hmm. uh, cover bands and uh, tribute bands. Uh, I played in a David Bowie tribute. Oh, and, uh, David Bowie! I, I, I like David that. Bowie. Yeah. yeah. Just after he uh, died. Okay. And uh, but I was playing most with a uh, rock and roll cover band like. Uh, Classic uh, Johnny Cash and uh, oh Johnny Cash, yeah, especially uh, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I was still living at home, but you could say I worked uh, professionally because I did like uh, eighty shows per year. So uh, eighty shows. I mean, that's quite. A, it's like what? It's like one to two shows a week. Yes, around that. I mean, in the summer it was like uh, two or three. Uh, shows per week and in the winter it was a bit uh, less than one per week and and so you're you're studying economics and playing drums and Saf Safia and AI like gets to you so hard that you like decide to you know move into AI right and, like the whole idea of building something like machines that can 
think like that's your inspiration as I'm getting it right machines that yeah, it was uh, it was multiple uh, coming together because I was a bit stuck in a rut with my study I was not uh, really enjoying it yeah and, uh, okay. I see playing I see. also became a bit repetitive in the cover band like the same uh, yeah, same songs over and over again and then uh, yeah artificial intelligence came along and uh, yeah yeah, I just decided to uh, pursue that. So, uh, so, okay, and like, I'm guessing, like, because you're still in the university and you're really active in the community, that you're enjoying it. And, you know. Yeah, I'm really motivated to, to learn. I still have, have to learn a lot. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, sure. We all, <laughs> even like yeah. the smartest of the smart. So. Yeah. so I mean, I mean, that's cool. And you're you're gonna be doing like four year studies for your bachelor's, right? It's... Yeah, the bachelor is uh, three years. Three years. And then uh, master programs in uh, data science or artificial intelligence. I still have to mm -hmm. decide which route I'll take. So that's two years. And after that, you can make the decision to make to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. There'll be another four years or work in industry. Like, uh, and there's so so much demand for um, for data scientists that most people just go work uh, after their bachelor or their masters. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are also some uh, uh, people. Uh -huh. There are also some people who uh, yeah get a PhD through industry like Google Brain or DeepMind. They uh, combine it. Please. Okay, so and like, what what would you do in this situation? Like, would you go work straight away, or you know, continue the status? Because I, I I guess you want to go deeper, or like like what do you think you're gonna gonna, gonna do here? Uh, yeah, for what I want to do, like uh, general intelligence, mm -hmm. I think yeah, it is wise to get a master's just to dive. Uh, deeper into the, the formal uh, concept, but I am uh, very interesting in combining uh, freelance work with study. Yeah, I mean, sure, like it's it's probably like the coolest way to do that, right? And and let, let's talk about like AGI because you're clearly really passionate about that, and you're the right guy to talk about it. So each time I think about AGI, I kind of start you know imagine like what would it take to kind of build something that can be generally intelligent because. No, in case of human beings, there was like a bunch of millions and billions of years of evolution, and like, w like, w w what could like theoretically be the tools, like some deep learning, maybe some so something that will come like uh, after, like you know, of deep learning or you know some math like what could be potentially be the tools to get get closer to AGI? Um, I think basically there are two paths. There are people that just want to make a copy of the brain, like literally, and people are doing much research on that. Mm -hmm. But there's also uh, yeah people who are rethinking the whole concept, like what is uh, yeah what is intelligence and how can we build it maybe more efficiently than a brain or with, without all the nuisance of evolution and uh, um, yeah, like the primitive uh, concepts that are inherent in uh, humans. And um, yeah, that is much harder, I think, because uh, yeah, you have basically have to start from scratch. We have like the neural networks and uh, and stuff, but yeah, we still need to combine combine it. Like, how do we combine computer vision and NLP and different concepts? And uh, how do we build a system that can uh, yeah, that can basically solve problems in, in uh, all kinds of environments, not okay. just one specific problem. Okay, so, so it's like you're saying, like, we have, like, an evolution neural networks that can kind of, you know, see and, like, recognize objects. So, so like, like we, we kind of have eyes and we have, like, maybe ears with, you know, recurrent neural nets. But we gotta have some special wiring for the brain to put all that together. 
like like some, something uh, like a brain. Yeah, if you have like a humanoid robot, you you not only have the eyes, but you also have hearing, maybe smell and uh, facial expressions, movement. And I think it's really hard to to combine all that stuff. Like if a robot responds to a question, how can it? Uh, yeah, combine movements, facial expressions, and uh, and voice yeah. to give a uh, proper uh, response. Yeah, but like even more than that, you know, l like I guess a robot could like answer a question. I mean, Google does that probably billions of times a day. I mean, kind of you know, answers your questions, but like. It's not. It's not really understanding like what it's answering, right? It's 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 kind of trying to optimize through like its you know data sets and like whatever the algorithms that like it was trained on and like optimized. Like, like it's kind of not understanding in a like human like way, but more you know optimizing for a for a some you know mathematical solution, right? So they're kind of not conscious, but more like mathematically optimized for performing tasks and like what could be the ways to kind of get more to the conscious conscious part of the conversation do you mean to recreate consciousness or something else i mean it's gonna take some sort of consciousness to get agi going right so I mean, I, I, I mean, like, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm like totally confused here, but c could you like clarify? Um, does the AGI like has to be conscious to perform well, or is it just something that can solve a ver ver variety of tasks? Like, does it have to be conscious? Because like, I'm not sure here. Uh, it's really hard because there's so many definitions of consciousness, yeah. but I think that a machine has to be conscious to solve problems in uh, in general settings, or like a humanoid robot has to be conscious to uh, to interact with humans. And uh, and what kind of problems like that? You know, they can. I mean, they can probably solve a lot of things, but. What are the problems that you're most excited about? Like that these conscious, uh, conscious machines machines can do. Um, yeah, it's really funny because the simple problems are often uh, very hard. Like this, uh, for example, Steve Wozniak, uh, co-founder of yeah. uh, Apple, he uh, sketched this problem. They call it like a Wozniak coffee problem, I guess, like when a robot is uh, is intelligent if it can just walk into a, into a house and um, make, a, make a coffee. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you walk in a, in a house, you have, you have very different coffee machines and uh, coffee maybe in uh, different drawers and you have to pick up cups and you have to do all kinds of things before you can make coffee that are uh, human just does intuitively and could probably do in you know, almost all uh, mm -hmm. settings. But for uh, yeah, for an artificial general intelligence, it's really hard. So uh, yeah, that's also what I'm interested about. Now, how can we generalize these problems for a machine? Yeah, I mean, like, human mind is fascinating. I mean, like, I, I don't know where I heard it, but there was like a comparison between like something like between convolutional neural nets and the human brain and it, it went something like in order to teach a computer to you know to classify an elephant on the which you kind of show with like maybe 500 to a thousand elephant pictures and to like teach a human baby to you know classify an elephant you, you can just show with like three pictures and like that's that's an elephant and human humans get, get it and I mean, it, it of course goes easier for animals because again, like it's evolution that, that that's like where we evolved. But even for 
you know, for like novel concepts, like you read about and you learn about it, about a new concept, like just from words, just from the like pure abstraction, like of it, and you can already kind of get all those images and pictures in your head. Like, I wonder again, what what should the you know machines have to kind of be able to maybe operate with those concepts maybe closer to a human level and maybe probably go beyond that um, yeah i think it has to interpret um contrasts and similarities mm -hmm. like the main thing you, uh, and like in nlp you have to uh, ts and need like to uh, dimensionality reductions and to group uh, different words and things like king and queen and castle come together and with, i think with agi we not only have to classify like words but also modules and a general concepts because um now for example with, with sophia there were a lot of questions from uh, children like some like uh, really simple but it really challenged uh, the robot and one question was uh, what is nine times nine Nine times nine? Nine times nine. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, you won, right? You get it. Yeah, yeah. By the way, but she, yeah, the robot had to think, like, uh, I think about six seconds. Even though some questions she answered right away, which were more hard coded. Or she had like three options to uh, consider. But with nine times nine, I think, yeah, she had to s search in the system, like, yeah, calculator module or something, and then it takes a, a couple of nanoseconds to compute 9.9, .9, and then you have the speech synthesis parts to translate that number into speech. So, um, and, and what were like the easier questions that you know Sophia got? Um, uh, yeah, there were a few like standard interview questions. Of what is the future of uh, humanity, or can a machine be conscious? And uh, yeah, it looked like those answers were more uh, pre-programmed. So if you mm -hmm. just had an answer. That, uh, so okay, so they they were like preset. Okay, uh, and you know, like from kind of your look, like like. Can uh, can Sophia respond like well to the questions? I mean, like, does she sound like somewhat like human hu human similar or something? Um, I've seen like a few demos, but there was a while ago. That that was uh, last week when I saw Sophia. Okay. But I think uh, uh, yeah, the machine often gets uh, confused. Like there was a question from a kid, uh, uh, can machines learn or will robots be able to learn or something? Mm -hmm. She just had an uh, answer ready. Like, uh, yeah, we would say like, yeah, machines can already learn. But she was just confused because she didn't have that concept or something. Right. Uh and what does she do when she like, I mean, when when like it's not pre-coded and she doesn't know, like, what like what are the algorithms doing to kind of come up with those you know more similar question like uh, answers, like like do you know like what's going on there? Uh, at the moment, it often gives a nonsensical uh, answer, oh. okay. which doesn't really answer the question, but. Um, yeah, there are some modules, like when the question is unclear or she can't hear it clearly, she has a response, like, can you repeat the question or stuff like that. Uh, that's building. <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> gosh, that's cool. Um, I, I mean, like, do, like, do, like, do you think Sephira is, like, is... I mean, at this moment or like in the near future, is going to be practical, or is it more of a like a show? May like is it more like a show now, or are they developing like some real technologies that 
you know, allow Sophia to, you know, be somewhat intelligent? Um, I think they're doing really fascinating work, but uh, a lot of it is also show. Like they go to mm -hmm. a lot of uh, talk shows and Sophia is in uh, fashion magazines. And they're at the moment, I have to, to tell by the way, there are at the moment 17 Sophias, of which seven they are constantly on the road. S and they're all connected. 17 or 70? 17. Okay. And seven are traveling around. That's a bunch of siblings for Sophia. <laughs> like that's and a all... big robot family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. and they're all connected to one system. Okay, so so, in... so she works li like a Google Translate. You kind of send stuff to the server, it processes and it gives you something back, like with the with the internet. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a little more advanced uh, than Google Translate. I mean, sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> But I think the big difference is that, um, yeah, the system is adaptive, so it can learn from interaction with humans. Mm -hmm. That's like a big thing. And um, yeah, all the Sophias, all the robots can learn from each other. So what is happening in Hong Kong, yeah, the other robots can learn uh, from that. So, so they have like a single big brain somewhere like you know, wh where like it's, you know, where all the intelligent stuff, you know, is happening there for Sophia. I, yeah, I, I, yeah uh -huh. I first thought they had uh, like a local system and a cloud system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, is that how it works? But I think that everything is uh, connected to the cloud. But sometimes uh, they have multiple robots on stage. They have also have some male robot Han, and they look like the interactions between the robots. And sometimes they get in a loop because they're partly <laughs> the same. But yeah, that's why I thought that they are, they are partly uh, local. But I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and how was the ro robot uh, robot con conversation? Sorry. Um, okay, sure. Like what? What were the robots talking about? Um, yeah, what it's like to be a robot and uh, <laughs> and uh, are and uh, yeah, how humans are behaving and uh, it's like stuff to make the make the crowd happy. I guess oh, uh, it's like I don't know, I can only imagine like oh that tough robot life. I hit the road every day and like drive around the world with my you know other seventeen fellow robots and I speak to humans and show them what I can do. All oh, that tough robot life. Yeah, they have to work really hard. They just push them on stage yeah. every day. And have to speak. With yeah, you. yeah. I mean, yeah. robots probably they just they just want to go chill, like to Hawaii or something, like get in get in like uh, ice cream made of oil or something, <laughs> and like just chill. Yeah. Like, wh what are we doing here? Then when they are traveling, they are often putting them in a box, like in the <laughs> cargo. So that's also really uh, cruel. Yeah, yeah. Like, like. Where are all the like Greenpeace people are looking? <laughs> but the funny people, funny funny thing is that people are also really already really connected to the robot. Mm -hmm. Like they already feel feel a bond with uh, the, the the ones who work with her. Um, yeah, but also yeah, like children and uh, uh, the, the the audience also. Yeah, yeah and just like people and. Uh, there are a couple of Sophias that are doing uh, meditation uh, classes, mm. so uh, the robot will, uh, yeah, will guide a few people uh, uh, with the meditation. So uh, yeah, people are really, are yeah, already really enjoying that and already, yeah, feeling, feeling a connection to the robot. So that's. Uh, Interesting. And so, like, w w when we kind of kind of imagine ro robots, we you know think of, you know, either like those vacuum cleaning. Ro I mean, I personally like vacuum cleaning robots. They kind of you know just kind of drive around your floor, or like the Terminator robots, or like a just giant server, or you know a drone. But 
what do you think would be like the future of human looking robots like Sophia? Like, like do you think it's like a special feature that you know that they kind of look and talk like humans? Um, yeah, I'm mainly thinking about like humanoid robots that can just uh, help you with general tasks. I think first they will be uh, prevalent in uh, healthcare mm -hmm. and stuff. But uh, uh, after uh, that, like, like uh, n nurses and all that. Yeah, what? like being uh, food and uh, attending yeah. to. Yeah, I mean that's reasonable. That sounds like reasonable, you know. Like not not all the tasks, but some. Yeah, I mean you know, uh, you know I, I I wouldn't let a you know robot like perform a surgery sur 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 surgery on myself at this moment. <laughs> Like that, that, that's that's not the best idea, I guess. But but like yeah, if if a robot brings me food and if it has a nice Sophia like smile, I mean, I, I, I'm all cool with it. Yeah, if it smiles and just uh, yeah behaves uh, yeah. correctly, not break stuff and uh, and stuff. Um, and I think after that, uh, yeah, humanoid robots will be in people's homes. But I've been, th been thinking, like, uh, do people really want, like, a six-foot robot in their house, mm -hmm. walking around and stuff? Or will they be on a smaller scale, or just a different uh, different kind of thing? Mm -hmm. But at Hanson Robotics, they are building, like, a little Sophia, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, with which you can uh, interact and uh, talk to, and stuff. Gosh. And uh, <laughs> I think cool. one reason is... Because it's practical, they can, uh, yeah, sell them for a few hundred dollars, and uh, um, people don't really buy like life-size Sophias. I don't know how much it costs to make them, but I think uh, like around eighty thousand dollars at mm. least. So, so they're like s selling them. So, I mean, I mean, I'm guessing the, like how, how they f fundraise it all. Like, I mean, one's probably shows, or are shows free? Or do you pay for uh, it? I, I, I mean, I, I'm wondering how do they, you know, fund all, all the Sophia research and development? Like, um, do they few, sell uh, them and also... Yeah, they had a few uh, investors, I think mainly from uh, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think it was mainly just long-term investment and investors knew that it would take a few years before they uh, get profitable i don't know if they're profitable right now but uh, so, 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 they were... sorry who who, who there um yeah they, i think the investors knew what they were getting into that it wouldn't be uh, profitable for at least oh okay yeah two years. Yeah. yeah but they are already selling uh, a little Einstein robot. Einstein robots? <laughs> yeah, I think it's mainly for uh, a kid's education, and just answering uh, general physics and mathematics questions. Mm -hmm. So they have some revenue from that. And I think, um, yeah, the little Sophia robot will be uh, a step up. Gosh. I I, I, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I, I, I mean, keep going, I'm gonna just Google an Einstein robot. I, I, I get excited. <laughs> okay, I, I want no. one. I mean, who, who, who thought, like, we'd talk to Einstein? I mean, if, even if it's a robot Einstein. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, I guess, I, I guess it's gonna, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of guess, like, the first time I kind of heard about the story, and I guess many people get like that. Oh my god, it's my little sister. I was, I was afraid of that. <laughs> oh my god, I told you. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna... You want to be on the screen? <laughs> you want to be in the show? I, I'm not sure she even speaks English. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean... I mean, she, she's quiet for now, so I'll just I, I'll just l l let her go. I'll just. Okay, it's no problem if she doesn't want to. Okay, she, she she went away. Good sister, good sister. 
that's that's the right thing to do here. Okay, so she went away. And so okay. <laughs> How old is your sister? Huh? Your little. She's she's five. Five. Okay. Yeah. So so she's she, she, she's not uh, like she's not like writing some code in Python for now. <laughs> okay. So, Not yet. Maybe next year. M maybe next year. Maybe next month. Maybe next week. Who know? Who knows what she does at night? So I'm gonna go, go like I, I Einstein Robert. I I I just. Yeah, I, I, just... yeah the handsome robotics. Yeah. You should see. <laughs> he's got. He's got. He's got nice hair. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna show you my screen. Just like. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. <laughs> I mean, he's got. Ni I mean, he's got nice hair. I mean, look at this gorgeous hair. Yeah. I Funny thing is, uh, the founder of Hanson Robotics, David Hansen, he developed this material called uh, he called Frubber, mm -hmm. and it's really convenient for uh, yeah robotic facial expressions because the human skin is also really complex, I guess. And I also see they implemented in in these little robots. I think. So I'm seeing there's like a little camera in his tie. So yes. So are there no cameras in his eyes? No, I think only in his tie. Okay, and where does Sophia has her cameras? I wonder. Oh. D d does she has her cameras in her eyes? Yes, I think she has two cameras. Okay, so Sophia's more advanced than Einstein for now. I guess <laughs> yeah. I guess Einstein will have to wait for another couple of years till he get he his his own pair of eyes. But yeah. I'm guessing that Einstein did pretty well on his. Okay, I'm gonna cut the sharing the screen. So, I mean, what was I saying, like, the first time, I guess, maybe it was like a couple of years, and I guess a lot of people get like that, and I, I, I think I got a little creeped out, I mean, it seemed creepy at first, like, a robot saying things, like human, so, I mean, do, do you think we're gonna kinda get over that creepiness of robots being like humans? Like, like on the, you know, massive scale? Yeah, I think it will be uh, natural. Because yeah. now... Um, um, yeah, kids really connect well to uh, to robots. They haven't seen other science fiction movies uh, yet. Yeah, I mean, science fiction movies are probably a big deal. Like Star Wars and all that. I mean, th th that, I guess, like, really... You know, gets people excited about robots on like a massive scale outside of like uh, the AI, you know, bubble <laughs> and all that. Yeah, it gets AI to a large uh, public. But um, yeah, I think as a young generation, young generation who is familiar with AI and like young people who uh, yeah grow up with uh, AI and robots, basically, it will naturally become less and less creepy for people. And what do you think like it's gonna mean for you know human beings and like the world that like like what's kind of your vision now of what it's gonna like what it's gonna mean in the long term for like I mean the advent of like AI and all the stuff that it brings the like AI technology in the future like how it's gonna transform you know humans what are like your thoughts? Uh, I think our main topic is like uh, scarcity. Like there will less be less and less scarcity. Like yeah, people in Africa nowadays are already using uh, like yeah smartphones and working with AI. And uh, you mean like there will be like uh, there will be less hunger and more like resources with AI available? Um, yeah, I think like food. Yeah, can still be a be a challenge. Because it's uh, yeah, it's a biological uh, challenge, mm -hmm. but I think more in the, yeah informational. There's not really much scarcity for everyone who has access to the internet. They have mm -hmm. access to like the world's information, and um, yeah, I think in general there will be less and less scarcity. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the, th the things are like gonna get a lot cheaper. You know, the manufacturing, like <coughs> the smart robots. I, I actually remember I was listening to a podcast on AI a while ago, and it was about it was about the guy who who's kind of in the cancer curing like industry who's kind of trying to find cures and help the patients and he was talking about not only how you know ai could help with you know the maybe th synthesis of you know like new of new medicine but also that in some parts of like may maybe africa may maybe probably some other parts of the, of the world there like as you said can be scarcity of you know resources but also like drivers so self-driving cars could help get people to hospitals and you know because it's maybe problematic to find human drivers so yeah i mean I, I mean like that's the really really bright part that gets me really going like that the like that the world <laughs> i mean that will have more re resources with ai and will hopefully be able to you know distribute them well because, like, yeah, <laughs> that's a big yeah. issue. But then, uh, yeah, also a big part is like human psychology. And do people realize that there's less and less scarcity? And, uh, um, uh, yeah, like, the depression and sleep deprivation, it's not really um, connected to, to resources in a kind of way. So people also have to learn to deal with that and become aware that is much more resources and information nowadays yeah i mean like well, hello oh, hello little sisters <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah i mean I, I was afraid of that and that came true and now i'm probably <laughs> less afraid of that yeah. you can always out if you want what uh, yeah first of interview yeah yeah i guess i'll edit that <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, n n now if you meet a Russian-speaking person, you can, you can say that you can tell, tell, tell to them like "Привет, как дела?" and that's good. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. What's called a skull? Cheers. What? Uh, what is a cheers called? A skull? Uh, cheers. Or is that knowledge? What? Uh, sir. Uh, cheers in Russian. Ch cheers. Yeah, like if you have a, a drink. Ah, and you're gonna say cheers. I mean, we usually, uh, we usually like, I mean, drink. I mean, not, not necessarily alcohol, but like, to, to, to the health. That would be like, the здоровье, to the health, and. Oh, and nastrovia. Oh yes. yeah, you got that. Okay, yeah. You heard that yeah. before. I yeah. think skull is uh, Polish. Polish? Yeah, a skull. Okay. Yeah, you call it uh, in Poland. Oh, you were in Poland? No, but there are a lot of Polish people in the Netherlands. Ah. Okay. So yeah. Okay. I mean, po Polish is kind of similar to Russian. Like they, they, they have a few similar wor w words, but it's not like that similar. But yeah, I mean, the, the toast is cor is very correct, and yeah, <laughs> pe people say that. So, I mean, let's go back to AI from my little sister and cheers. And yeah, what are you talking about? The brain interface. Oh yeah, the brain interface. Um, yeah, so I think that's the, that is the next step. We just can't go like full-blown mm -hmm. intrusive trying to connect the brain uh, to the computer. And just to spend like uh, hundreds of humans on uh, testing that, mm -hmm. and so I think, uh, yeah, non-intrusive computer brain interface is like a yeah intermediate step. So you think that eventually will kind of, so so you think that it's kind of way to avoid like c cutting the brain open and kind of putting some you know electronics in it that we kind of place something around our ear and do things with. Um, I, I, I heard like Elon Musk in some areas say that the like one of the ways to do it was to kind of get some blood injection that would kind of flow the electronics, some nanorobots or something to your brain and also connect them. 
Yeah, I mean... Like, do you think we're... Yeah. Do you think we'll, we're, like, likely to have a gi giant, like, server, you know, with AGI, or is it is it g gonna be more like a bunch of humans having superhuman level of level, level of intelligence enabled by this you know deck yeah well there are some people like uh, you know, like Ben Goetzel and uh, Nick Bostrom who wrote super intelligence have you heard of him mm -hmm. maybe maybe I heard the title okay and they are mostly yeah talking about like a super intelligent system which we can merge with or we can just upload our brain and consciousness mm -hmm. to the system so that's the the extreme view i guess mm -hmm. and uh, i think there will be uh yeah it will be like an an option to like merge with machines or stay away from machines and uh, live in nature or something <laughs> but <laughs> back to the wild I'm <laughs> gonna, gonna, pick, pick, gonna pick up my spear and go hunt some, uh, some, some beers. Yeah, I like nature. My my yeah. parents live in the woods, so uh, I really like it. Yeah, yeah. But, I actually also a huge fan of nature, like camping, all that stuff. It's 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 gorgeous around here. When it comes to nature, but yeah. I never did. Um, uh -huh. um, Smartphone detox or social media detox? And did you ever ever do that? Like, take a month off social media or devices? Mm. No, I, I mean I I don't do that. But I I try to kind of disconnect maybe when um I, I'm I'm commuting from like as from school to my home and m maybe not use social media that that often. I've, I've actually been doing for the last couple of years some work to kind of lo lower the like useless like scrolling through feed social social media time that you know causes me to kind of get anxious and procrastinate and all that and kind of live like more useful time like maybe you go and reply to people on Twitter or start conversations and all that are, are you doing like detoxing or like something? Um, no, I only uh, yeah disconnect from uh, from social media after nine. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes I'll send a WhatsApp or a chat with somebody, yeah. but yeah, I think I never had like that extreme social media like useless scrolling and uh, and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I did okay. did delete Instagram recently from my phone, but yeah, I try to be aware of uh, social yeah. media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I heard Suresh Ravel, you know, he, he does like a day, a week with no social media. And, yeah. And he like claims that it helps him to be creative. I, I actually pretty much agree with that. I was reading that book the other day, it was called Go Wild, you know, it was basically, you know, book on how evolution, you know, ma made us a certain way and how even though like humans are like the ultimate adaptation machine, like we can go and live in the forest so we can go and live in the society how there are you know some evolutionary presets that we you know can ignore and like the more mainstream ones are exercise and like uh, sleep and good good diet you know and like the less the less maybe obvious but the ones that we're probably innately fascinated are like nature and like time in nature um, the fact that our immune system you know, really get stimulated in a really good way when we're out there. You know, I I, I think you know, and, and I mean they did like those studies where they took people and like first group walked around around the city and the second one like walked in the forest and then they set them down to do some tests on them and the first ones that like they scored higher. So like there's definitely some. You know, real cool evolutionary stuff going on with the brain, like uh, with the brain in nature, which makes it useful. And I also like think that nature is cool and like exploring nature is like one of my favorite things. Yeah, I think society as a well, whole, yeah, we really has to to learn to deal with social media. And because uh, yeah. I see a lot of people in my uh, in my class actually like they're on their phone or playing games, mm -hmm. or chatting with people, and I think it gets. Yeah, we're in a 
period where it will get yeah harder and harder for people to to focus or to to be creative because we're co we have constant distraction yeah i mean it, it it totally like it totally makes sense like i agree i mean it's kind of it's kind of the, like short-term gratification right is it is it like what it's called like when you yeah. can, when you kind of get mm -hmm. the quick rewards and something that is creative and focused like it it takes a while so yeah i guess that like mental strength is a it's a really 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 important thing um are, yeah because it, uh -huh. yeah i think more addictive than people think like you yeah. post post a picture and you get like 10 likes and maybe you don't notice it but you yeah you get the, the gratification yeah, like, I'm, go I'm, go I'm gonna be honest, like, I mean, like, that, that happens to me, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of trying to control myself, but sometimes when I post th something on social media, I'm, I may go back a few times and, like, uh, uh, refresh the page and see, are there likes, like, I'm, I'm really not trying to do that, but sometimes, like, that kind of, that kind of slips by, sometimes on Twitter, too. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you kind of, like, where are my likes? Yeah, but, but, you know, it, it's really... It's really like the evolutionary like monkey in the brain, and I'm I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm more trying to you know. Take yeah, but care I think as, focus. Mm -hmm. as you become aware of that, you can yes, I mean, kind of step back and think like, hey, this is not really that uh, that useful or that uh, healthy. That thing. so yeah. then you get the control to yeah to choose. If you want to yeah, I mean, like that, that's it. like the beautiful thing about consciousness that you can and that's why you know humans really really good at adapting because like even if in this really unnatural situation we can still think back and kind of try to model our behavior so like are you like what are like the ways that you kind of try to control your social media use to kind of make it work for you and to your best interest um yeah i try to keep uh Twitter like more for for learning and yeah. sharing stuff that people uh, can use totally and um, yeah. I don't really use that much Facebook anymore mm -hmm. maybe a like, major event I'll post something or if I like to promote some uh, things and uh, YouTube I yeah I'm using YouTube a lot mm -hmm. but I also try to uh, use it mainly to learn yeah new things. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not on Facebook for now, but there's like r r Russian Facebook thingy that's kind of like Facebook. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm mostly now spending my time on Twitter and YouTube. And yeah, I mean, that, that's probably pretty much it. I, I heard that cool thing that. It's, I don't know what it was called, but it was kind of the approach to social media where you kind of ask yourself, like, how much time, like, wh like what is your intent there? Like, what are your goals? Like, whether you go to, like, Facebook, um, do you want to, like, 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 do you set your intent to go and scroll for half an hour and, you know, then feel not that great about yourself, you know, your feet? Or like talk to people, or and like get get some up useful updates, and you can kind of ask yourself like, how much time would it take to just go and re reply to people and like keep yourself, uh, keep yourself, you know, like keep yourself up to date with like all the stuff that's going on, and you know, chances are it's not an hour like thirty minutes, it's more like fifteen minutes to like go and reply. So it's kind of like what's your intent versus like what are you actually doing yeah i mean that's, yeah, but that's the thing that helped me but it's really hard right because you have that temptation of yeah instant. i mean of course it's, you can't just reply to one person and then go, yeah, go. look what's going on yeah so. i mean i mean um you know the, the companies they kind of want you to also stake us like they're you know trading on your attention and like it's d designed a certain way to to make you you know go, go back and 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 then spend spend more time but, but i mean yeah they're... yeah what? what are you going to say what sorry what were you going to say i don't know i i, I was like expanding on my thoughts on 
how 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 it can how it can be hard to control ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 like maybe yeah. but like maybe it has the potential to be like the. 21st century version of like m- meditating somewhere for 16 hours like in the I don't know like some Buddhist you know monks kind of thing like uh, 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 like but it's but instead it's like us trying not to use our phones too much uh, if it harms us yeah it's really like learning a skill to just uh, yeah yeah maybe reduce it to the essentials yeah I think that also like the cool thing about it is like the brain kind of when you train it to be more you know more more, like more strong you know if i can say that on those topics it it also probably like kind of transmits to like other areas and you may be like able to you know study with a, a greater amount of focus and you know like yeah yeah it's basically choosing between like short-term gratification, yeah, yeah. Yeah. long-term. Totally. Uh, yeah, like uh, achieving long-term goals, and, yeah. uh, long-term satisfaction, and uh, basically the choice between short-term and long-term, I think. Yeah, I mean, and again, like, we didn't evolve, evolve to, like, think, uh, like, what career, careers and relationship, w- relationships will we have 30 years from now? It was more like, hey, like, he- hello, Mr. Mr. Tiger, please don't eat me. Like, I'm gonna, like, run away from you. Like, n- n- no need to bite off my hand or, you know, something. So, like, that's, <laughs> that's understandable. But, but also, like, yeah, I mean, I'm actually quite fascinated with evolution and the ways that it's evolved our, you know, most, like, our worst traits and our best traits and our traits that we, like, don't even know we have. So, like, yeah, but w- when consciousness kind of comes into play, it kind of gives us a, cho- a choice to, to kind of, to decide like whether we, we, we want to you know triple down on like the good stuff that we can do or can we kind of get sucked into you know short-term gratification and like ang- like h- hate maybe not just anger and all that so like yeah mm-hmm. I, mean, w- I mean like what do you think of like the whole human evolution brain like uh, thing uh, and like how do we you know operate with all that in our daily lives and consciousness <laughs> the, the, yeah, that's one I complex want, question. <laughs> I want to come back for, to the social media a, a bit. And yeah. Come back to the question. And I agree that uh, yeah, most social media systems nowadays are really optimized for it, your attention. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, you can say is that ethical of companies to uh, to mm-hmm. do that? Of course. To, uh, like hack these um, yeah these primitive systems yeah. of the human brain. And you can say then, uh, yeah, because it really gets deep in the in psychology. Like, what is uh, attention, and how are we, how have we grown evolutionary to to pay attention mm-hmm. to certain things? Mm-hmm. Why do we pay attention to things that are moving or mm-hmm. big contracts or if something's missing all of a sudden? Yeah, and I think that's also really uh, interesting. Yeah, and maybe even more fascinating, like than that. Like, I mean, it's one thing when humans do that, but right. But coming back to AI a little bit, there are algorithms that you know there are kind of trying to you know hit those kind of nerves in human, 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 human mind. You know that kind of trigger that attention, like on you know social media, on like YouTube. You know, I, I mean, I'm talking about the recommendation systems that are AI powered, like. That they are also trying to kind of attune themselves to, you know, to kind of get our primitive mechanisms of attention to work in their favor. And you know, sometimes it's good because you know, like you may see a useful learning YouTube video, and sometimes it's not so good. But yeah. No, it's yeah. Recommendation systems are obviously going really uh, complex nowadays. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think they are, in a way, they're still quite uh, primitive. Like for Amazon, uh, for example, if I like machine learning and deep learning books, 
<laughs> the system will rec recommend to me even more machine learning and deep learning books. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that um, I'm probably aware of those books that he's uh, recommending. Mm -hmm. So it's not really that useful. And if I would have wanted the book, I would probably have bought it already. Mm -hmm. So I think more interesting um, uh, recommendations would be something that I would never have thought of. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I've thought about reinforcement learning, but uh, for example, if we take, yeah, I'm buying a lot of machine learning and deep learning books, and it would recommend to me reinforcement learning instead. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it could very well be that I didn't really dive into what are the books on uh, reinforcement learning and stuff. So that is probably then a useful recommendation. So I think there's still a lot of lot to be gained in recommendation systems. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, do like, do you know? Like, have you studied it somewhere? How they work? Um. Yeah, I really want to uh, dive into it more, but um, yeah, it's mainly like um, um, with Netflix. For example, mm -hmm. you have the, you had like the five star ratings, and nowadays you have only thumbs up and th mm -hmm. thumbs down. And what the system basically does, it it compares you with similar people, and tries to look for um, what what yeah what kind of people, um, what kind of person are you, mm -hmm. and what are persons like you watching. And then it recommends uh, those movies. And I, mean, I think that can be really effective. I mean, because... it, it it sounds like an uh, an algorithmical thing. I mean, is is there like a combination of like algorithms and AI that does that, or how does that um, work? It's a bit of a different field, but I think nowadays it is studied alongside AI, mm -hmm. and you can use uh, AI algorithms to solve that. But it's mainly with, uh, with embeddings. But I'm not really that that familiar with it to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to explain like the the okay. concepts, but yeah. know sure. the high level uh, concepts. It's, um, yeah, it just looks like uh, to what person are you uh, similar, and then if you like a lot of action movies, and this person also likes a lot of action movies, then you probably would like this movie. Mm -hmm. that you have watched and of course youtube does that uh, i'm not i'm not i'm not oh, i'm not that often using using netflix but like yeah i mean youtube i mean you, you kind of forget i mean probably yeah. netflix is the same thing kind of forget what was the last time that you've searched for a certain movie or a video because like it it knows what to recommend and oftentimes yeah. it's yeah. pretty pr pr i mean like it's good yeah, if you have like a Google account and you visit uh, YouTube, often you get mm -hmm. like really good recommendations. Often, but um, yeah, I think YouTube is far more advanced than an average uh, recommendation system because it has all these data. It has not only what do you watch on YouTube, but the whole Google account and everything you mm -hmm. do on Google, Google Chrome, Android devices. And uh, yeah, I think it's really hard to say what they are using nowadays what they can use nowadays to make the recommendations yeah i mean they're like the big data company and the big data and the ai company I mean, totally their their you know revenue depends on the on, on like all, all the algorithms that they're using and like yeah i mean i actually think that it's it's, it's i mean as we've talked like there are maybe you know not so like, you know, not the best things that may come out come out of it. Like you know, you may procrastinate on like watching some stupid you know YouTube videos of like I don't know cats like doing some weird stuff. Uh, I mean, I mean we all been to like some similar like some kind of something like that, and or you can or like if you train yourself 
kind of to maybe use YouTube for educational purposes. Like the recommendation system may try to kind of mimic your interest and eventually kind of start recommending your even more useful content. Like you may, I guess, train it to give you more educational content, you know, than like entertainment that you may not need. Like, I guess that's the cool part. I've, I've actually been noticing how I get less and less of entertainment and more and more like of some cool videos that I may enjoy learning, whether it's like on AI or some other fields and things. And I recently heard something that I found curious that um, YouTube recommends a lot of uh, conspiracy theory videos hmm. in general. And um, this is all Illuminati. Um, <laughs> yeah, like those conspiracy theories videos. But um, I think that people, I, I'm not sure what exactly the reason was, but. Um, I think, yeah, people who are interested in conspiracy theory videos click more often on conspiracy th other conspiracy theory videos than normal people on YouTube would click on general recommend recommendations. So that's, I think, why the algorithm adjusts that it also recommends more conspiracy theory videos to people who are not particularly interested in conspiracy theory mm -hmm. um do, like do, do you have some thoughts on why is that like why are we might be into conspiracy theories as humans um i'm not sure mainly because they are extreme or uh they are novelty mm -hmm. but, I'm a novelty um, definitely. and people would like to uh yeah, often like to blame like big companies and uh, yeah. and government, and so I think it's. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. You would have to ask the people who like uh, conspiracy theory videos <laughs> to get their opinion. They would tell us that that it's like it's because of the Big Brother who watches them and they want to watch him back or something. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I also heard that there's kind of in the United States that there's something with the, like, the whole flat earth thing, conspiracy theory, and all that. Um, I mean, to me, I mean, the biggest, you know, something like conspiracy theories are more like pseudo sciences, like homeopathy, homeopathy, or like whatever it's pronounced, or stuff like that, that kind of. No, you know, th th that I can see in everyday life. Well, no, more like locally where I live. Oh, it's probably like one of those things that kind of makes us want to, you know, kind of, kind of makes us attracted to the idea of knowing things that maybe other people don't know or something. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, yeah, a part of why people get sucked sucked into those videos is because uh, um, yes often there is some some truth in it or some subtle mm -hmm. relation of truth but you can't really verify if it's true or not mm -hmm. so I think people often get yeah keep watching those videos and believing those those things so so, 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 so they kind of make a hook with like something that's true and then, you know, start telling you other things that may not be all that true? Yeah, I think you really have to, uh, yeah, like do a deprogramming on people to, to get rid of certain concepts. Because if concepts get repeated, like over and over, it's natural for uh, for humans to uh, believe them. Mm -hmm. Like what happened in, the, in World War II, like these mm -hmm. concepts got repeated over and over. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you, you, you mean like when people were sent to war and like go and like fight for your country and like all that. I mean, I mean, I mean when like the whole demoralization of the opponents and like all that. I mean, all that like war stuff, you know. Oh. Yeah, it, uh, it happens on and on. And for example, also with uh, with cults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cults. Just, yeah, just repeating the re repeating the concepts and. Uh, isolating them from uh, mm -hmm. from family and friends and that's the way that cults get control over people mm 
I mean, it, it actually makes sense because, like, if you think about it, if you live like you know in the in the evolutionary environment in the cave, and there is like a bird that you know flies you know on a on a tree like next to you every day. It's probably kind of natural to think that, like, if that's, like, the you I hear, if that's, like, an event that I see so often that it may be true, you know, and then it's, like, again, like, whether you'll be able to kind of consciously process that and find, you know, how mu how, how true is that. Um, have you met people in your life who were, you know, into some conspiracy theories? Um... Yeah, I've met people personally, but not really for mm -hmm. long-term interaction. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's mainly just uh, they're just re repeating the repeating the concepts. And you can really see that people just yeah heard the concepts over and over, mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily uh, necessarily bad. Or good on something, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's inherent in human uh, in human nature that concepts that get repeated and that you mm. see every day or hear every day, you yeah, you start to uh, you what, believe them as reality. I think like there's a saying like what what gets repeated gets remembered. So yeah, yeah. there's there's definitely a lot of truth to that. I and there were uh -huh. yeah, there were a lot of things that that may or not be true, like with with consciousness, there's an extensive discussion, mm -hmm. and it's easy to just accept one view, one camp, and I think yeah, the hardest part is to stay open-minded and stay open to different concepts without getting sucked into one uh, one part of the conversation. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I may sometimes get that, you know, I accept a point of view and then it's hard for me to to change, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Of, 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 oftentimes, like, when the information is sufficient, they kind of switch and probably take a more reasonable approach, so... Yeah, if you take, like, a primitive society, people had to, had to trust each other and had mm -hmm. to accept certain things uh, as true, and else they, they didn't survive. Mm -hmm. And even in recent history, you just um, um, yeah, it's natural to just trust what your parents uh, parents say at a young age. Yeah, because especially at a young age. Yeah, because often your survival survival mm -hmm. depends on it, on on trusting other people, people who are raising you. So you grow up with this, those concepts, and if you hear something from yeah, from like where you were born to uh, to where you are now, those concepts are really ingrained. So, uh, mm -hmm. so it's yeah. Sometimes it's yeah. It's just impossible to deprogram a certain viewpoint. Okay. And you see, mm -hmm. with cults, people who uh, were in cults for five years or ten years, it's really hard to yeah to say deprogram them, even if the the counter evidence is so blatant that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, people just yeah, don't understand. and that'll be like probably true the other way around. Like if non-cult people were like like if the cult reality like became the reality, like it probably would have been hard for you know, other people to change too. Like, are there any like uh, prejudices or like some things that you thought were true, but then you change that you're comf that you're comfortable sharing? You know, like something that you thought were true, but then you kind of walked away from them and now you think that you did the right thing mm, yeah I think if you become interested in a different topic it's naturally interested it's naturally now let's say it again um, if you become interested in a certain viewpoint or a certain uh, mm -hmm. thing it's natural to hate or disapprove the other side Mm -hmm. so, uh, um, so let me take an example sure yeah people who are often really into science mm -hmm. they often become uh, atheists mm -hmm. because they just can't imagine 
that there is something other than only the, the scientific part. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I would like to believe that I learned to become more, more and more open-minded. So not necessarily label one thing as good and one thing as bad, but just as a different way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think I've been, you know, thinking about similar things about how. I mean, not only that, like good or bad is like relative, and not not like the, you know, not not like like not, like there is no like the truth to like good and bad, but to more like how, you know, different things have both, and how humans, as I like mentioned earlier, have like all the good traits and all the bad traits, and you know, yeah, I mean, like, I think. I think like that kind of thinking, you know, it takes effort when when you kind of process, you know, the information, and you don't just label it as true or not or not true according to like your previous belief beliefs, but but like if you're if you're able to do that, that like yeah, like that's how you discover all the cool things. I heard like Elon Musk in the interviews talk a lot about like the physics first principle approach and how you kind of reason from the fundamentals and I guess some some su some version of of that is probably also useful when trying to figure out like trying to stay open minded and kind of you know keep yourself keep yourself yeah that. I think a good generic example is like the, the iPhone and Samsung phones mm -hmm. if I if I like my iPhone then I don't have to hate samsung users yeah. or hate samsung or something and uh, yeah i think the challenge is to learn to yeah be enthusiastic and stand behind what you like mm -hmm. like an iphone but not necessarily disapprove or hate yeah people or something so uh, yeah even, even though that can be tempting because yeah i heard the one study some while ago where like they 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 took took just you know n n normal people, probably it was some like uh, some like school camp or something, and they kind of separated them separated them into two groups and one were like given their their names the other was given like their names and their like flags and all that, and you know as they kind of got their differences they you know became really really competitive with each other, so that's also quite a natural thing to do. <laughs> You mean the movie? What? The movie, the wave? Or... I think. I think. Yeah, no, no, no. I think. I mean, there probably was a movie, but there was, I think, a study done somewhere, some, so, somewhere by some researchers. Okay. But, but yeah, I mean, sure. there, there probably was a movie. What, what, what was it called? It is a movie called The Wave, and they have. Yeah. Um, it's an experiment with uh, school kids. And I think they also divide them in two groups, and the teachers just mm -hmm. gradually sets them up against each other. And uh, I don't want to give the spoiler alert to the movie. Um, the thing I googled is a Norwegian geologist and his family fight for survival when a massive landslide causes a 250 foot tidal wave. It, it, oh, I, no. no, it's probably not it. Let's see, it's called Die Welle in German. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's relatable. A bunch of movie names that I've kind of used to are in Russian, so it, it, it takes some, you know, effort yeah. to translate them. The Wave is a 2008 German socio-political thriller film. Yeah, if you look up uh, Die Welle, then you will find it right away. G Weller? G Wellen? W E L L E. G Weller. G, G Weller. A teacher given the task of instructing high school students about the autocratic state during a week long. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna show you my screen. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's it? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 And then I also, also have uh, yeah, the stamps for the prison experiment, mm -hmm. which is a slightly different. Uh, but you, uh, do you know that experiment? I think I heard it. It's, it's the one where 
there was like a researcher telling uh, telling some students to kind of shock people with electric electricity. Shock. Yeah, that's a Milgram experiment. Uh huh. It's, uh, that's called a Milgram experiment, where they had to uh, like give uh, increasing uh, shocks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I people heard that, about that. Shocks. Mm -hmm. That's pretty famous. Yeah. But yeah, the stand. Uh huh. What? Yeah, yeah, I heard about it, and there was like the researcher, like the more officially he was dressed, the more shocks they were able to give. I mean, they yeah. were wi willing, willing to give. That's right, and there was also a lot of uh, a lot of hype and discussion about it. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say nowadays what was actually the result of the experiment. But uh, anyway, yeah, the, the Stanford Prison Experiment was um, ten students they put mm -hmm. in a in a cellar. And they divided them in uh, guards versus prisoners. Mm -hmm. And apparently the, the teacher told, told the guards, like, you really have to watch the, uh, watch the prisoners and uh, treat them as if they were uh, prisoners. Mm -hmm. And the story is that it really got, got out of hand and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of violence and stuff. And yeah, that I, think, I think I've heard about it, but keep going. Uh -huh. And that experiment was also really hyped up and mm -hmm. discussed a lot. But uh, yeah, I think the general principle rings true. Like with big wars and fights, it's often like we are good and those are the mm -hmm. bad people. And the other party thinks like we are the good people and those are the bad people. And that's why uh, things often go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and again, like it's it's understandable why we have that, cause, cause, cause like, I, I don't actually know. I mean, why do you think we have that? Like in the evolutionary context, like why is that good and bad thing is useful? Cause, I mean, what do you think? Was it like uh, our like tribe mates? Some of them bad, some of them good, or was it like the predators are bad? Or... Uh, yeah, I think it's more like uh, tribe thinking. Tribe exactly. Thinking. Like you are, um, you are dependent um, mm -hmm. on the tribe for your survival. Mm -hmm. So you really have to help the tribe and stand behind the, the ideas of the tribe. Mm -hmm. I think that is the basic context. Context. Yeah, yeah. Because there comes another tribe. You don't know if you can trust it. Mm -hmm. You don't know if they will uh, will feed you or protect you. Yeah. But you experience that for your own tribe. So your own tribe stays the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that just goes through evolution. Mm -hmm. And the same and thing and, uh -huh. and the same thing prob probably works when it comes to like the country like like w like when there's a war, it's probably the same like tribal part of the mind working that says that like go and protect your tribe, protect your home, like there are some foreigners or something. You know, like it, it's it's probably the same part of the brain that that kind of gets uh, triggered when when there's a country-wide conflict. I mean, I'm kind of thinking back to World War One or two. I mean, because yeah, because like that's how the brains evolved. Yeah, yeah. my opinion is that it also is mm -hmm. yeah come from tribe uh, mentality, mm -hmm. and then with that there's also uh, yeah a lot of group and social interactions. Like if many people are doing it, why wouldn't you do it? Or why would it be bad to do it if everyone's doing it? And that kind of stuff. Yeah, and like, and like another thing that probably came from it is that we're kind of paying more attention to kind of bad things, you know, so to speak. Because like, it also what our survival dependent on. And yeah, it's it's like like we, like we weren't really talking about how we evolved like in ourselves curiosity and love and friendship like all the cool things because yeah like like what do you think are like the cool things that we evolved with and like kind of that we have now like mm. I feel, uh, do you, can you name a time frame? To think in like hundred years, ten years, thousand years. I mean, what you I, I mean, I mean, whatever time frame is like, but like, works best for thinking. In 
Very good. Um, yeah, I obviously think that, that AI is really interesting. Mm -hmm. They've been around like uh, since the 50s. Yeah. Or something. But uh, yeah, what I found curious was that mainly the inspiration to start artificial intelligence in the 50s was right? mm -hmm. artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think nowadays it comes more and more into focus again. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, yeah, there was a time when AI really became became practical. Things like uh, if you imagine the the last deep learning revolution since 2012 or mm -hmm. 2014, yeah, yeah. people really found real world applications um, for deep learning and uh, AI techniques. That yeah, people and could make more, more, money with it. more data and more computing power. Yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, the initial inspiration was artificial general intelligence uh, to build intelligent machines, mm -hmm. to build human-like systems, that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and, and like, what do you think it is like in us that inspires us to build those maybe like human-like or machines or like whether it's AJ or like Sophia? Like what it is that you know ex ex excites us to kind of build something that is intelligent. Well, what I found among uh, top AI researchers, like watching lectures and interviews, mm -hmm. is that their main inspiration is more understanding themselves, like mm -hmm. their own brains, their own minds, mm -hmm. and that's why they want to build an artificial brain or an artificial system to get a better understanding of what is it like to be human or what is consciousness or what is the brain doing exactly. And do you so, think they, they want to build it, let it develop and then ask questions or do they, they kind of aspire to, you know, learn all that stuff while building it? Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of, of building blocks and a lot of people are needed to build such systems. Mm -hmm. though, so even though people who are really interested in AGI may work on self-driving cars or uh, neural network architectures or something, mm -hmm. just to build part of what's needed to build a super intelligence, I guess. So, uh, yeah, so I don't know, we've hit an hour and a half. That was awesome. Uh, oh, that's nice. It, 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 it's, it's, it's been like real quick to me. I don't know. I think we've, we've just, just started. So, so you want to go for another 10 minutes or should we wrap up here? Yeah, I can uh, still go on. I don't know. If, is it our latest in there? No? You have to go to sleep? It's, oh. it's, it's uh, 1, 1, oh, 10 a.m. But it's 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 not big. I I I I have napped, uh, you know, in the daytime, so I'm like uh, fresh as I can be now. So okay, yeah, I didn't imagine that uh, talking would come so uh, organically because we still have a lot of topics that we could discuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Like, okay, so what are like other things that are on your mind? Um, yeah, what I think is really interesting is a thing uh, that's called top-down learning. Top-down learning. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of the concept? Top-down? I, I, I haven't actually. But top -down. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Jeremy Howard and Fast.ai, the courses? Not really, but I'm gonna Google it. Top-down learning. Mm. So, can, can, can you kind of give me like a brief explanation of, of like what's going on there? Yeah, I think it's not possible in all fields. But in AI, we have uh, yeah, like high level, high level libraries like uh, Keras and uh, Scikit-learn. Mm -hmm. So, we can basically build a neural network in six lines of code, right? Yeah. So, if someone learns to use those six lines of code, Mm -hmm. He can solve a real-world problem. He will often get excited to learn more. Mm 
mm-hmm. and he will naturally learn all the little interests yeah. that go with that six lines of code. Okay, so it's like top down. So it's like you start, you know, in this exam from a high API, you get excited about the way it works, and now you're interested in kind of figuring out like what what are like the deeper like layers of it that allow this thing to work. Yeah, it's basically you solve a real world problem right away, mm-hmm. maybe in five minutes or mm-hmm. something. You already build an image. Uh, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of what, what practice, I'm doing, I guess. In practice, it takes a lot more time. But uh, yeah, for example, YOLO is also pretty high level. Yeah, right? it's super high level. It can it can still be hard, but uh, there's a lot of going on in mm-hmm. the background. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing that I'm figuring out there now is like, how do I get training data? It's like, you know, experiment, exper- like doing experiments with like generating it and, uh, yeah, like h- how do I get good training data and how do you train it on? And like as you said, as you kind of get to, you know, trying to solve it in five minutes, you figure out that well something was not labeled correctly, but something was like also was fundamentally wrong and like you didn't, uh, you know, like, I don't know, computer anchors or something there, or like, your, your, like, your image resolution is just too big that, like, that small number, small, small digit, you just, it, it network just can't physically see it, so, yeah, I can re- relate a lot to top-down learning. Uh, yeah, that's right, it naturally pushes you, pulls you further into yeah. it, and you'll learn more about it, and, uh, more about low level, I heard you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got also uh, interested in uh, mathematics and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, th- that's yeah. that's kind of how I actually started. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, it was actually t- top down, but it was math. I mean, I picked up that textbook. It, it's called Neural Networks and Deep Learning, and like the first chapter of it was like in the first chapter, the author was already showing how to build a forward neural net in Python with just NumPy. So, no, I mean, obviously you get like really excited, like, okay, like we're now gonna like build a real neural net in uh, Python with NumPy, but because it's just NumPy and Python, uh, to understand like kind of like what's going on, you have to, you know, kind of wrap your mind around what's going on with math. And you know, the second chapter was on back propagation and that seems scary, but after a while, it kind of started to make sense. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, it's it's super effective when you have like a problem at hand to solve, and and you kind of kind of again. I, I think I heard I heard I watched a bunch of Elon Musk interviews, and he was talking like, you may teach like what are screw screwdrivers, or you may you know be building a car and like here's a car in the screwdriver to like screw the wheels to it or you know like yeah I mean, that's definitely what works for me are you like that too um yeah if you contrast top down learning with uh, with classic mm-hmm. university education it's more like down up yeah learning, learning all kinds of concepts mathematics concepts mm-hmm. programming concepts statistics and we'll learn how to use it just further mm-hmm. along the road, maybe in the in the third year or mm-hmm. <laughs> after you're doing your PhD or something. But um, um, yeah, I think it, it is harder in general for people to stay focused and motivated that way. Yeah. Because yeah, they don't really tell you why you need to learn calculus, why you need to learn mm-hmm. statistics. And if you go the other way, around I think you get more in motivated and curious y- yeah for example yeah uh-huh. for example with fast API's uh, machine learning for coders course they mm-hmm. implement a random forest regression mm-hmm. and you can just do with scikit learn you can import random forest regress mm-hmm. and then you can just use it I can specify the model model dot fit mm-hmm. and there you go and after that, they go in the yeah, into what is going on, mm-hmm. and like further along the course, you have learned to implement a random forest regressor from scratch, like with only NumPy. Right? Mm-hmm. But I think if you start with that and building a random forest 
progressive from um, Pi, it's a lot harder for people to yeah. stay focused. So yeah, that's why I like top-down learning. Yeah, I mean, too, but I mean, I, I wonder, I wonder if like the bottom up, I mean, like, I, I've started to kind of think about like Einstein and kind of scientists that, I mean, they may not be solving problems right away, but I mean, it's kind of interesting, like maybe like, what are like your thoughts to like, like, do you think researchers, when they kind of try to come up with new concepts, they, 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 they do something like, like, do you think for research top down it also works, or sometimes it's bottom down? I'm, I'm just trying to frame a question, like as I go, as I kind of think about it. Yeah, first I don't think that it uh, applies to. Uh to all fields, but only to specific, like it is really convenient that we can use high level libraries to mm -hmm. build a new network. Yeah, sure. But um, yeah, I'm sure there are also, yeah, there are also a lot of down downsides mm -hmm. to that approach. And I think, uh, you know, like what you would call bottom up still has a lot of value, like uh, university learning. Yeah, but like probably in ninety in ninety five percent of the cases, top down work works best, and you know it's it's like it's like even the stuff that I like I've learned this in school. I probably re remember only really the stuff that like you know when there was a lesson and you know there was a debate with a teacher. You were like discussing some topic actively, or like in a programming class where like you were actually building building something or coding something like that's what really really like get, get, gets remembered right yeah, i think if you apply it to uh, physics and chemistry chemistry mm -hmm. it works a little bit different yeah. but it's still like uh, that like you do an experiment and something explodes and it gets all the kids mm -hmm. curious like why does that explode and then they learn the the mm -hmm. concept but um yeah, it's probably like the mind, the mindset of like let's imagine or like let's see something happening, and then let's try to replicate it. Not just learn for the sake of learning the tools that you know allow us to replicate it. I mean, like, like let le let's learn the tools how to do that to make so something happen instead of just learning something for the sake to like learn something. And like, yeah, I mean. In physics and in chemistry, it's probably, it, I mean, sure, like, they probably don't have psychic learn where you kind of, like, I don't know, to type into some, you know, chemical computer and, like, it mixes your things. Well, probably some, some some chemistry guys do. Um, but, but well, yeah. I, have to, uh -huh. I have to do physics in uh, my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was learning how to circuit diagrams and, you know, you do have on the internet like circum circuit diagram simulators, mm -hmm. so that's maybe a little bit top down because you can play with it right away without having to deal with a physical mm -hmm. circuit or make the calculations. Yeah, but but it's more like, it's more like the mindset. Let's let's try to like take take the biggest advantage that we have of active learning and like le let's learn, you know, with the intention to you know. To act to learn actively because it gets us motivated and it, it's kind of more effective to process that things, to to process what you learn, to, to not not process but like to process and to apply, and th then to just like kind of hear it and then you know forget it or something. Yeah, but I think if you you talk about it and uh, try to explain it. To other people, the concepts it also gets more ingrained. Yeah, the, the, fine, oh. the Feynman technique. Right? Yes. Yeah. You, you, you tweeted about it, right? Some. Yeah, I tweeted about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, because... I remember. I also watched that watched that video from, from Thomas Frank. Yeah. Okay. Th that was a good one. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Richard Feynman. Yeah, so. I, I watched his interviews too. There, there wasn't that many, but they they were cool. And also, um, I guess I'm. I've read halfway through the six easy pieces by Feynman. 
Okay, you're reading the book. Yeah, but like I've stopped now and I've picked up other book, but I'm, I'm kind of coming back to the book every once in a while because uh, I, 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 I tend to lose interest. I mean, I mean, not, I mean, with that book, it's, it's kind of more like when I want to kind of, I mean, it's kind of a mood thing when I kind of want to read about physics. I come back to the book and I've been like kind of doing that maybe for six months now, but I'm halfway through it and kind of reading other things as I'm going through the book too. H have you read that? No, I don't know if it's uh, similar to the lectures. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically it's basically lectures on paper or okay. on, on Kindle in my case. Yeah. Because I saw the, the videos. Yeah, I mean, but m most of the stuff I saw the videos. Yeah, the oh, okay. the 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 interviews and the lectures. Yeah, I mean, they, that guy's like he's a showman and and a scientist. I I, I really like that. Oh, it's 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 maybe part of the reason why I'm trying to do you know like this thing here in the YouTube because it's kind of cool to maybe to share to kind of and to actively engage and talk. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, with Richard Feynman, if you can explain quantum mechanics and things like the double slit mm -hmm. experiment to a general audience, and I think you're a real boss. Yeah. He's a nickname to the great explainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's physics. Hmm? So that's physics. Um, do you have a topic you want to uh, talk about? Or, uh, I, mean, I don't know, maybe we'll bring something well, up. Like maybe, what are the, the the the. Like what are the like classes in your university, uh, that are you know taught in the ways that you feel like you get the most of them. Like again, coming back to that, how how we learn, you know, thing, like what like what are like the, like what are the classes where you get like the most of your l learning kind of process. Like, uh, and because of what? What's interesting, uh, we have this course called uh, Data Statistics. Mm -hmm. And they have a method they call Flip the Classroom. Mm -hmm. So they don't really give lectures, but you have to do everything yourself, mm -hmm. basically. And uh, yeah, they've given one lecture now in three weeks. So what I did, I was just thinking, uh, top-down and Feynman technique. Mm -hmm. So I would just um, have videos online, so I just watch the videos at 2x speed. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I would just, yeah, I'll just build a notebook with all the concepts in it, mm -hmm. so that I can, can play with concepts and apply them. And then I, yeah, want to explain them. So if I, I don't know how to explain them, I have to learn more about it, mm -hmm. but I guess uh, for me personally, I can really learn fast mm -hmm. that way. And it's also a win-win situation because I can share the results with other people and uh, mm -hmm. they can also learn uh, from it. And so, uh, do, you, do you get to, to do that uh, you know, often enough? Like, are there many opportunities to like do that in classes? Um, or like it's more like a, okay. an outside a lot of lectures, class thing. Mainly, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry. So it's not really uh, given by the university, but it's yeah more of an idea. Mm -hmm. And then they also have like the, um, for example, with physics, they have uh, general lectures, mm -hmm. yeah, old school lectures, and then they have the tutor hours, where. You a PhD student or a master student discusses the topics with you and exercises. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, that's also really helpful because it really, uh, yeah, you really have to apply the concepts in a whole different ball game than only listening to a lecture. Mm -hmm. So, um, so like, what are your maybe then favorite classes? Because, like, uh, aside from you know, are you taking anything? You know, aside from data science and AI, I'm just um, I really liked uh, programming mm -hmm. in the first quartile because it was just Python program, and even though it was 
really uh, basic sometimes. Mm -hmm. And really... why did you like it? What? Uh, uh, why? Like, why did I like it? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe because I um, understand the material mm -hmm. already very well. So, yeah, you could say because it was easy, it was also fun, but that's not really always the case. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I liked it because it was a different perspective. It was more around the software engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. So naming your variables properly and making good comments and giving type hints to your function. So, so, it's, and I so it, was, it was less like, let's learn the syntax is more like, let's learn how, how, how do you actually use code to build something you know, beyond just print hello world. Yeah, for example, um, often in machine learning with high level libraries, we just um, have more of a hacky attitude. So we don't call it mm -hmm. a machine learning model, but we call it uh, M or we call for I and C mm -hmm. do D or something like that, because we are just going to use it ourselves and we understand what those letters mean. Mm -hmm. But if you work with a whole team, you just, you can just uh, do that because other people wouldn't understand what you, uh, what you coded. No. So I think yeah. Comes yeah. The concept of making code uh, understandable and documenting it uh, properly, mm -hmm. I think that was probably the most interesting part of the programming course. Yeah, I mean, that's probably something that I have to learn because, like, I feel like my code is a mess, probably. Because, <laughs> like, I'm kind of, okay, like, let, let's code this feature. Hmm, it also needs, needs this feature. Let's, let's put it here. Okay, let's not do the function for, like, let, let's just copy and paste it, like, there. And uh, and then like yeah, it, it it becomes quite painful to you know figure out what does what. Uh, and also, I don't think it's just the case with you. But if you want to solve a problem, I just uh, my first reflex is to go code, not not really think about the, the structure, yeah. or, but just uh, type. I don't know. Is that also with you that you? Mm, often... I f I feel like it depends. Um, B before I start, I often kind of think about it a bit, but when I start, it's more like, let's just go and see what happens. So yeah, I, feel, I feel like before that, I usually kind of think of like, what am I even trying to do, but when, but when I've started and the kind of, the complexities come up, I, I'm, I'm kind of just going my way through and experimenting. It's, it's also like that thing, pr pr probably in some way, in some ways related to top-down learning that I find useful when and, and probably to like maybe so, to some to some extent to fi the Feynman technique wherein when you're trying to solve a problem you start like really small like when I was you know gener generating the data set and today I was fixing it like let's just show a picture let's let's put the image of a you know house number from the, that data set there okay let's try to draw like a simple rectangle in OpenCV. Okay, we have a rectangle, then we can like gen generate labels from it and kind of try to build up from that. Some, sometimes yeah. sometimes it works, sometimes I, 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 I get into a mess and just just type, 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 then nothing works, but sometimes it works, so that's good. <laughs> but do you do, do agree that those kind of things like showing a picture or putting things in a, a data frame, like that in itself can be really satisfying and fun. Yeah, and of course. I mean, like that's the whole thing. Like, like, like if, if the, like I don't know if I had the motivation to continue without that kind of satisfaction. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably like you you can use that short term gratification to kind of check your phone, or you can kind of control yourself and get that from other sources, and that can be like really beneficial. If you can do that. Mm -hmm. That's great, but um, yeah, I think uh, interacting with code and trying out stuff mm -hmm. is uh, like one of the most important things. Yeah. You also have to learn like the formal concepts and the formulas mm -hmm. and stuff, but often I can better see the context of a formula within code than with all the Greek letters and, uh, and stuff. Yeah. So, um, 
it's uh i mean i mean it's it's probably because once you've put it like the gr greek letters like especially when i was like first reading them like i didn't know what they were like at all i mean some of them like sigma maybe but you know, once they're in, in code, they're kind of in, in a familiar language that you can't can understand. I mean, do you know, like, when 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 you put it on code, do you understand it better, or do you mean like when you see that in someone else's code, and you're kind of able to pick up that better? Um, yeah, I think looking at uh, someone else's code oh, okay. is also really instructive, but. Um... I think the most important thing is just implement it. Uh, to do, to do, that, to do, that, do that yourself, right? Yeah, and I yeah. sometimes still have trouble with that because it's easier just to watch a mm -hmm. video yeah, or yeah. someone else's code because implementing it yourself requires a lot of work and sometimes mm -hmm. frustration and things often don't work. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I think it's really important that they... Um, that they need to use it more in the university studies. Yeah. Uh, Implementate real world experiments. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I mean, like, yes. I mean, <laughs> do that. I mean, I mean, there, 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 there has to be, you know, some change in the education system that kind of gets it all up to date, you know, with like, you know, especially, I mean, it's cool, but that get, gets it up to date with, you know, with the internet, with the fact that there are a bunch of resources available. I mean, I'm, I'm probably thinking about, like, Khan Academy, like, all, all those things, like, there, like, there, there's probably gonna be innovation, and it's already here, because, like, a bunch of learning materials are out there, but, you know, it's, it's, it's probably gonna either, you know, come into the you know, traditional institution like universities or like high schools and all that stuff mm, or or like they are i don't know or they will cease to exist or something like like yep. like, like what are the innovation that you kind of notice in education system you know, I think things that... like uh, Khan Academy and online lectures are already embedded in university studies mm -hmm. because they are often given as extra materials mm -hmm. so uh, yeah it's already a part of formal mm -hmm. education of the online learning okay. and yeah it's no longer like we have to begin here and we have to end here we can just say what do we want to learn and learn that specifically like search it on the internet and watch the videos and uh, maybe write some code or do some calculations mm -hmm will learn the concept, but it becomes more and more important to design your own uh, learning plan. Yeah. And to really think, what do I want to learn? What do I want to achieve? What do I want to build? Yeah. I mean, it's like, again, I think that a huge part of like why uh, being, you know, self-taught in certain areas like works really well is that you have the freedom to choose something that you're interested in that other people may not necessarily be that interested in you know and thus you can go a lot lot d deeper into that like that's like that's just like a huge advantage when it comes to learning and like looking back on all the things i've learned myself which is probably a big part of what i've learned like, like that was exactly like this way I got interested interested in something then I went and like figure figure it out and it wouldn't necessarily make that much sense to someone who didn't have like my con context and like that's probably like a really really great thing about like the world that we live in today everyone can go and just look up their own you know study plan and get the knowledge and yeah yeah really agree. Like, um, uh, yeah, people can get high level jobs without degrees nowadays, but it is. I mean, do you think it's possible uh, to get a job? I mean, or like, do you know it's, whether it's like possible to maybe get a job as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer without a degree? Or do you need a degree? Like, my, 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 like just out of your experience and like the place that you live in and all that stuff. 
And I think it's more of a social problem than a logistic problem because you nowadays you can just lock yourself up for three years and I think maybe eventually learn more than you could in university. Mm -hmm. But university is also a social thing. Yeah. Mm. You come there to interact with people who are interested in the same things and learn from people who know more about you, mm -hmm. um, know more about the topic than you. And you also learn a lot that way. Mm -hmm. And also like people skills working together, building things together. So I think that uh, yeah, that is also really valuable. If someone wants to hire you, he needs to know if you can work with other people or perform uh, tasks mm -hmm. and sometimes do something that they may not feel like doing, but mm -hmm. because they are working there, they would have to do it. And I think those kind of things you can yeah. learn only in yeah, in school or in university. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I guess, like, I'm, 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 I'm not, like, studying AI full-time, but I guess I'm kind of, you know, like, doing a podcast on YouTube and I'm working with my friend locally on a project, so I'm kind of trying to, you know, suck into as much of, like, that good social environment in myself and hopefully, like, provide some value, <laughs> like, ooh. You know, along the way as I can. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, more, of a, more of a balance because there are people at university who are drinking full time or people <laughs> who are stuck full time. And I think like the, yeah, the wise part is somewhere in between. Yeah. Interacting with people. And Definitely. Sometimes you just have to grind and learn alone. Yeah, like I think, I mean, I think it's like a total good thing to like enjoy yourself or like have fun. Like, yeah, sure. Those are all cool parts of being human. Learn cool things and like chill out if, if, if that like what feels right. So yeah, I enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. also. So I also wanted to kind of ask um, about the way you, I mean, it's, it's a bit like off topic, but like, how did you learn English? How did I learn English? I had English in high school, mm -hmm. I think like the full six years I went to high school and then when I studied commercial economics mm -hmm. I had like two years of English mm -hmm. and now my whole bachelor studies mm -hmm. is in English and I think also a lot from uh, from games mm -hmm. and uh, yeah <laughs> playing with people online yeah a lot speak English. but uh, yeah I think especially nowadays I'm almost uh, speaking English full-time because the whole study is in, in English and all study material is in English. So, uh, yeah, that's how I learned English as a, over a long period uh, of time. Mm -hmm. So, how, how many years like was that? I think since... Yeah, I was already playing like PlayStation games mm -hmm. and then I was six or something, but I think formally, maybe even in the last year, before high school, so that's 13, 14 years. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, and then both, uh, yeah, both formal education mm -hmm. and informal education, with, uh, interacting with people. So, and how long uh, did you study uh, mm -hmm. English? Well, All right. I mean, I I played games, but like it mostly was when I started to watch movies in English, and kind of. I, I, I've tried to, I mean, I, I've learned to kind of think in English, and once you learn to think in English, it's kind of the same thing, like the same problem muscle in the brain that lets you speak. And yeah, a bunch of like active learning through watching movies, books, English, and AI. So now I'm basically like, when I'm in school, it's uh, like what, like when I'm in school, it's like thinking in Russian and talking in Russian, or sometimes also in English because it's a habit now. And when I'm back, it's like uh, thinking in English, you know, studying in English, doing podcast, doing a podcast in English, and like all that cool yeah. stuff. And it, it, it works for me very well because I mean, I don't know because I get enough Russian there and uh, enough English here. And yeah, yeah. that's cool. That's so how you also get uh, the formal English classes mm. in school. Yeah, but like. 
I wouldn't say. I, I mean, I mean, it, I mean, they were useful to kind of get the foundation. Um, I guess I've started to like really get deeper in, into English, like maybe three years ago, something like that. So I've had like the basic foundation of like, what are maybe some tenses, what are like some words, but. I mean, I feel like really when I start from like that top top down approach, when I kind of had movies and TV shows that I liked in Russian, I was like, hey, like heck, like why not go and watch them in English, like Doctor Who and like all that cool stuff. Um, yeah, and I kind of went and I was I was basically watching a bunch of things with subtitles and translating them with Google with Google. Then I started to use Anki the kind of flashcard words and a bunch of YouTube videos that explain grammar, like articles. There are no articles in Russian. Are there articles in Dutch? Articles? Yeah, like in English, like A, D. Um, sorry, what do you mean? Articles? Oh. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, like... Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, like... In English, like there are like a like a, a an apple or like the apple. Oh. Th this okay, race. yeah, I know what you mean. They call it uh, voorzetsels in Dutch. In Dutch, uh -huh. yeah, you have like uh, uh -huh. un and de and things like that. Is it is is Dutch similar to German? Um, some things can be, mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah, also some grammar is like, really different. Mm -hmm. I had to learn some uh, some German in high school. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned like that movie that was German, so I assume that you speak German some um, level. Yeah, that movie is also in, in English, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we watched it for a German uh, class. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and I had to learn French also in yeah. the first two years of high school. Um, I forgot more. Uh, okay. okay. But do you have to learn uh, other ling languages besides Russian and English? Um, I've had German. Mm, I I'm currently like, I'm graduating my high school this year, so like I've learned German was. I mean, we don't have German now in like the later years, but I've had it like before, and. And yeah, so like we've had German probably like up to ninth grade or up to eight, something like that. Now I'm in 11th, it's like the final grade in Russia when you graduate. Um, yeah, but like there was one hour a week and, and that was like, to be honest, quite boring. So I don't know, I, I, I honestly just, uh, like I like German and I've kind of tried to even learn it myself, but I, I will like probably like go like ask a teacher whether I could go out and like go and like walk around the school for 20 minutes and then go back and it's like, it's like not even a, a a a a story that I made up. I mean, that's like what what it was. Okay. Just go. So just German. just go away to the elementary school and like say hello to like small kids and like twenty minutes have passed. You can go back. Say like here I am, uh, teacher. There we go. <laughs> okay. Like that so was only... that was weird. Okay, so you had to learn uh, German, Russian, and. English in uh, in school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it kind of. I don't know if it's it was the same way with Dutch for Dutch for you, but it feels like learning Ru Russian, even though like it's a native language in school, is much harder because like they suddenly like give you like all those like in depth concepts of like you know like I don't know how do I even say that in English like all the like grammar stuff like nouns verbs like all the like different exceptions in language so it's, it feels it feels it feel, feels harder and like I, I i think i have an a in english in high school and i have something like a, a something of between b and c when it comes to russian so oh that's interesting but the, um do you think the grammar is more complex in russian than in english mm. what you had to learn I think it's more. It has more to do with the fact that in school they kind of teach you, because like when Russian is your native language, they kind of teach you more ra Russian more in depth. And 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 when I say like they teach you in depth, it's not only like writing and like essays. It's more like some uh, some su some just you know really really tedious memorization of rules and stuff like 
it, it's basically like how do you take some word I mean probably like there are similar things in other language but like how do you take the word and kind of like write all the characteristics of it with the language but also do you mean like in German you have like daddy does and uh, all the things you have to memorize I'm sorry I was interrupted <laughs> okay do you mean something similar to uh, the German uh, thing like daddy does yeah Did you have to memorize um, yeah I think a lot of people speak English I think older mm -hmm. people maybe a bit bit less but yeah. most of them get around like reacting if someone asks something in English and in the big cities uh, yeah, there's also spoken English a lot and um, yeah I think everyone also had like a bit of German in mm -hmm. school there's also a mandatory mm -hmm. so, uh, and French I don't think it was in the past mandatory, but it is mm -hmm. now. In the so it's like three languages that you have to learn. Yeah, that's four. Uh, and with French, with with Dutch, yeah. Yeah, Dutch, English, German, and French. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then some people learn mm -hmm. Latin, Greek, but then I can. Uh, um, Sorry, what's like that language? Like in high school. Uh, Latin and Greek. Ah, la la like the traditional Latin, Latin and Greek. Okay. That you have to learn for if you want to go into medicine, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, some people also learn that mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. Okay, and like, what's your? I mean, what are like your favorite languages of them? I mean, I mean, like, or like, which did you like enjoy learning maybe more than others? Uh, yeah, basically English and Dutch. Yeah. And Python, I guess. And Python, yeah, of course Python. Like, <laughs> yes. I, 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 I love Python. I have a friend and he, and he like codes in C++ with whom I like doing the project and we're like... And, and, and he, uh, he he constantly says that like, how can you code in Python? Like, you, like the classes are wrong, like it's not like in C++ and I'm, and I'm basically like saying the reverse, like, what are you even doing in C++? And I'm like, think about your life, like... Stand up for your rights and like go and fight them. Like that's uh, that's how it's been going for the last year or something. Yeah, C plus plus coders are bad people. What? C plus plus coders are bad people. I would like you to know that. But, but, uh, yeah, of course, I mean the the, <laughs> the, the, the the real people they code in Python. All the people that code in C plus plus. Do it wrong. The, the, real man code in Python. What? Uh, sir. Real man code in Python. You're, you're coding in Python here? No, real men code in Python. Ah, yes! <laughs> That's what I'm saying! I mean, the people that code, code in C++, like, they're reptiles. Like, they're, 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 like, they're the people who are the conspiracy theorists are about. Like, <laughs> like, like, they, like, they flew down from, from the moon or something, from the, Mar from Mars, and, like, just try to spoil us with their C++. Yeah, yeah. to get back to our good people, bad people discussion. Yeah. C++ versus Python. Yeah, but like, it's obviously Python, like... <laughs> Python is nice. Yeah. Of, of course it's Python. Mm. So... I was thinking about this shirt that have like a uh, real man code in C. Mm -hmm. Because it's at, uh, at the hackers convention, they are often uh, sold. I, I remember like the video from Suresh and he ha had like that joke that like... Th there was... Mm, I mean, he was basically like a... some. I mean, you remember like when he was like, "Today we go in Python." In a moment, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? Okay, from three hundred, like that. Yeah, yeah. Today the, there was some in videos. Python. Yeah, today we go in Python. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, that, that, that's what we're doing here. So, um, let's see. Um, can I? You recently made a Kaggle account, right? Yeah. Did you do anything with it, or uh, go on the website, looked at some things? I get emails from them now. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> okay. Yeah, they bother you a lot with emails. 
uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I, I read some of them, like they're, I mean, they, they sound like they are, it's like a new data set or something. I mean, I, I honestly like haven't gotten like my hands dirty with, with C C Kaggle all that much. You know, now, for example, you were looking for um, a data set, mm -hmm. right? With, with images or video or what in particular are you? Uh, the one that I'm working with now, or the one that I was, or the one that I might find interesting. The one that you want to get, because you said you are spending a lot of time getting the data, getting uh, the training data. Yeah, I, I found that open source data set from Stanford that was basically SVHN, which is like Street View House Numbers. It's basically like web scrapped images of house numbers from Google. I, I can show you it. Okay. Can so we have plenty of data. Real quick, what I mean. Mm. It's basically. I mean. May, may, maybe not that quickly, but but you, you can see kind of here that. Those are all house numbers. And I'm, and I, and I'm kind of tr trying to figure out whether it's even possible to generate a good training data set. Because. No, I don't want to just train YOLO to detect numbers. No, like in this form. So, so basically, the th that was like the image that I've got, and I've got a bunch of backgrounds, and I kind of throw those images on those backgrounds, and sometimes they they split like here, and sometimes. Okay, oh, that's cool. Yeah, but it, it, it hasn't worked so far, but I'm hoping that this time it will. So, what is your goal to just detect the the number or also the position? Or... Um, I'm 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 working on a project uh, as I mentioned before with my friend, and we're basically trying to, I mean, combine like I'm doing like the neural network stuff, and he does the you know algorithms and output, and we're trying to do something like a little um, assistant for people with impaired vision, so like to help them you know. In this case, like to get on the bus, to, like get the bus doors and get the bus numbers, and then my friend handles the output so, so that it's like voiced and nice and works and like shows the relevant stuff and also like other YOLO stuff. And now I'm kind of trying to figure out faces, and of course, um, and of course, uh, while you know figuring out how to do all that, I'm also collecting a bunch of knowledge on how to. Kind of neural net let nets work and trying to share that okay that's cool but so your main concern is the yeah, the numbers then conveying the, the information like bus uh, lines or house numbers gosh i gotta occupy a basement or something or like go go, go in the woods and like uh, for 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 as long as my wi-fi lets me it's like <laughs> people put a lock on the door and uh, put a lock on the door, like get, get a <laughs> get a giant chain and just or 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 like wield the door, like you know, <laughs> shot. <laughs> uh, sorry, what were you saying? Uh, so your main concern with the model is to um, yeah classify the number. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea is that like once I get all the numbers in the bus, like I would use yellow. I would find all the buses in an image, and then I would iterate through each bus and kind of apply, I, if that thing works, apply the digit detection there. And basically, like, if, say, there is a bounding box of a uh, one or, like, over one next to a bounding box of a three, then, like, it's 13 and something like that. I'm thinking. OK. Like, oh, that's a really cool project. Yeah. But, yeah, I, gu I guess it's really hard if the numbers are spread out. Right? Or is, um, is it less challenging than, a, than you would think? Um, I think it's... I mean, I mean I'm, I'm obviously like trying to spread out them around the image, so kind of the model gets like what happens if they are, you know, not together and spread out. I mean, it's... I don't think that it's possible to like say for sure whether like two button boxes together are numbers are, are like a single number or not so the idea is that you basically say that like i'm waiting for the bus of the number um 24 and if you see 
to and four together on a bus, then like that's likely a 24 bus. And then you can kind of start checking like whether its doors are open or closed or something like that. Uh, okay. And for example, with this picture, mm -hmm. you have like the one and the five, mm -hmm. and they have like a multi label classification or something when it recognizes the one and the five separately and it recognizes, yeah. okay. Uh, I, need I mean, the whole data is. Yeah. I get I get what you're asking. Um, the whole dataset is made like of those pictures, and they had, I mean, they already have bounding boxes for those numbers. So I've made like with fifty percent chance, chances, it's either like the entire image uh, placed uh, placed on top of another image and like adjusted uh, its scale so that it's not too small, or it's uh, or I basically take bounding box, uh, crop it, and place it randomly like for each number so like that's th that's how i hope that will work again it it it, it kind of worked one time but after about fifteen thousand iteration on training it went to like nan i mean the loss so yeah but again i had bats and hopefully that'll be better this time but okay. but yeah like that th that that was like the seven gigabyte thing that i was uploading in the beginning of the conversation so you know take takes a while and uh, what are you working on you know currently um i think over the last weeks i've been working a lot on just basic uh the exploratory data analysis mm -hmm. and working with uh messy data and visualizing data mm -hmm. like more data science uh, stuff but i would like to get more into um I like the details mm -hmm. of uh, convolutional neural networks and more into uh, NLP uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. but, uh, because I, yeah, I really have, I really struggle with understanding uh, natural language processing, like the, the embeddings and the, mm -hmm. the LSTM uh, RNN models and stuff. I, so I would like to learn more about that. I, I don't really know much about, you know, uh, all those like recurrent neural nets uh, either so yeah I'll, I'll, I'll probably gonna learn about them too at some some point um uh, like like what are the ways that like your data science skills ca can be applied because uh from what i know it's kind of like in science when you kind of look for correlations and some like clustering and all that stuff and when you're kind of trying to get insights and probably in business, like trying to solve some business problems and like get answers with data. Is that like what you're using data science for? Yeah, you can often get a lot of insights just by looking at the data alone if it is presented in a particular visualization. Ah, so it's like a visual visualization, of course, yeah. Yes. So, um... mm -hmm. So that's really helpful, but also like basic uh, machine learning mm -hmm. math, like linear regression, logistic regression, uh, decision tree algorithms. Mm -hmm. I really understand from what is model, what is the model doing, and also like why is the model classifying that mm -hmm. as uh, as that, and uh, yeah, then you get into uh, feature importance with uh, random forests and uh, uh, correlation mm -hmm. analysis and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think that's necessary to uh, to learn if I want to go uh, further into that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. And it's also for community, communicating things to people that are not really into Data AI. Or yeah, I mean, sure, like, th th that's a huge, huge part of, like, of you know, of you know, actually up, up, applying you know the insights to the problem. So, 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 so you're kind of implying here that a lot of the cool stuff that you're learning in data science is related to the way that you can visual visualize the data and then analyze it and kind of get some insights from it. Yeah, just get. Uh... Yeah, of some basic in insights like the distribution of mm -hmm. a data set or how many people are male, how many people are female. Mm -hmm. If you have like an income income distribution, you can compare different mm -hmm. groups of people with the income distributions. 
And you can already say a lot about the data set and you can already communicate those mm -hmm. insights to other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm also learning about that because that's what's going on in my uh, in my bachelor studies. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I have to. And when I get more time, I want to get more into uh, deep learning mm -hmm. again. So and and I wonder, and you probably know more about that. Like, what is? I mean, the data scientist, scientist I heard like the the job was like one of the like uh, hardest right now. So it's like really really you know, needed by the market. So like, what are the data scientists kind of doing in their job? Because like, I can't kind of imagine what machine learning people are doing there, like, whether it's like R&D or whether it's like applied, but data science, um, do they kind of like, what are they doing? You, you probably know about that. Yeah, it's more about analysis. So not every problem needs uh, a machine learning algorithm. Yeah, of or course neural network to uh, solve the problem but often it's just yeah we got a bunch of data from uh, from a website or from a machine or uh, some sales data or something and we want to understand from how can we uh, optimize the business process or sell more stuff to people or how can we predict yeah that's already machine learning when a customer is going to go away mm -hmm. right or um, when what people have the tendency mm -hmm. to go away so we can send them, them an email with a discount uh, or something like that so but it's more like an analytics mm -hmm. more like direct so, so, like, so like the analogy that kind of comes to my mind is that data science is more like math and machine learning is more like computer science, oh, I mean, it's, it obviously is, but uh, it's more like you, you use it to kind of like do some sort of like science, uh, not necessarily science, but like do some problem solving that requires you to look at a bunch of data that's now available and for and you can use machine learning to build applications with the, you know, data that's now available. So, so, so it's kind of the data science is more like let's analyze and make, no, as you said, analytics, let's analyze and make better decisions. And machine learning is more like let's take the data, let's take some mathematical models, let's figure out how we can achieve, perform, like, how we can teach computers to do things that are impossible to hard code. So, like, the, mm. uh, is it like the correct kind of understanding? Yeah, data scientists use a lot of machine learning, mm -hmm. but they don't have to understand it in a way that machine learning engineers or computer scientists have to do that with low level code or um, mm -hmm. assembly or how the, it works with the processor. But we mostly have to uh, apply it as a data scientist. Mm -hmm. And then we have to put it in a broader context. So my bachelor studies also includes uh, law and uh, ethics. Mm -hmm. So we have to put like this prediction model, is it right to implement it, is mm -hmm. it legal to implement it? And a data scientist has to think about all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. While at the same time using mathematics, statistics and uh, machine learning to get insights. Mm -hmm. I've actually been reading a book a while ago, I guess. That's kind of what in a way kind of got me interested. Um, about big data. I mean, it was something it was called big data. Maybe it was like a year ago or something. And the and there was like a chapter on like probably something similar to what you are describing now, which is like there will be needed, you know, people who understand who who, who can kind of combine the understanding of like law of like privacy and all that and data science and kind of pr pr like pr protect. Uh, like, like make sure that all the like data science stuff is going according to the law, law, and both from like the people standpoint and from the company standpoint, so that you know neither get into trouble. So, yeah. so uh, so you have uh -huh. specialists. You have specialists for every field, like in law, in ethics, mm -hmm. in machine learning, and a data scientist. This data scientist has to mm -hmm. know a bit of everything. 
so yeah. you can communicate with all the departments and get the necessary insights to uh, yeah to improve a company process or, or a product yeah. whatever it is so it's kind of a person who can work with a wide variety of you know intersecting at like some points like tools uh, to kind of make to, 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 to like bring some value and some use yeah, yeah. Smart. and then on top of that the data scientists can also have a specialization mm -hmm. in uh, machine learning or, or ethics or and law. you're specializing yeah. in machine learning or yeah. Um, yeah I'm really interested in the yeah in the technical side mm -hmm. in the machine learning uh, but also like the general general uh, cognitive science and uh, psychology uh, stuff mm -hmm. but then also in the context uh, of AI mm -hmm. but there's mostly, mostly like a long-term path I have to learn a lot to yeah. actually build such a thing or create it and so you probably get yourself like going with 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 uh, projects to kind of like I mean like I mean like that's a long-term goal that you have to to like be there to build uh, artificial ge general intelligence, right? Yes, there's a still a lot uh, of work to be done because it's also intersects with uh, with robotics mm -hmm. and uh, things like uh, safety, privacy. Mm -hmm. There's really a lot going on if you want to build a general intelligence. But um, yeah, it's really a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. And it requires a lot of people and a lot of resources. Yeah, I mean, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Like, like, like any progress there, like it's probably gonna be like, you know, like there yeah. will be ups and downs, and there will be like small gains. But over time, yeah, I'm quite co confident that we'll we'll get there. I mean, and, ho and hopefully, like we'll get get there for the good of humanity and like the world, and you know. And and a bunch of things that has the capacity to be improved will actually be improved because of that. Yeah, hopefully it will be for good. Yeah, hopefully. Or maybe ho area. Yeah, hopefully there will be no war with uh, China's like autonomous weapon drones, like uh, or something. <laughs> yeah. That, that... Also, other challenges and temptations, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But it may result also into into war and bad things. Okay. Yeah, I know yet. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic about it because nuclear weapons have been around for like what seventy-five years, and yeah, and uh, and we're all still here. So I guess humans are rather good, and it's and even though like there are sometimes not like the greatest thing that's going on, like there is also a bunch of great and good things and. Hopefully, like that's that's like the and like that's a his. Hopefully, that's like a historic trend that will continue to go up. Yeah, I think the historic trend is that we yeah become more advanced and more sane. Like if you think a few hundred years ago, yeah, slave, slave was like normal, and now yeah. in the Western not not accepted anymore, not uh, right. So. There's also mm -hmm. a progress, right? And if you look even further back, you have like the Vikings. Mm -hmm. They just slaughtered the mm -hmm. camps. And then um, at some time, they began to, to capture mm -hmm. prisoners. So in that way, slavery was actually an improvement to the slaughtering. Mm -hmm. But that's within that context, like a yeah. few thousand years ago. So, but now, it's uh, yeah, it's different again. So I think yeah, the generally general trend is up upwards. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm, I'm really enjoying this book. It's called Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, and he, nice. you heard about it? Yeah, I know. Like the uh, psychologist, right from Harvard. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yes. and he's got he, he's wrote like a, a really really great book. I, I'm about like thirty percent through it now. 
uh, he wrote it in 2018, so it's like very recent. And he's basically, it's called Enlightenment Now, the case for, I think, progress, humanism, science, and peace, probably. And he basically, like, makes a point there that thanks to the advent of, like, Enlightenment values uh, of, like, reason and science and humanism, and you no, know, the change of values from like some war honor to like peace, uh, like uh, a lot of good things have happened. He basically like shows a bunch of those graphs uh, where it's like violence going down, uh, like famines and like hunger like going down because we're actually like people were saying like back in the day that like like we're gonna have to starve half of the population because you know humans are growing. In, in geometrical progression and we can only produce food in like arithmetic but guess what turns out that with enough like reason and effort uh, we can actually produce a bunch of food with geometric progression it's like not to say that you know uh, the problem is solved but it's to say that we can solve it and he's basically making the case for that like a reasonable optimism that with the right tools we can actually solve a bunch of great problems and not only like problems but like achieve also like great aspirations but, like, yeah i agree and then again the trend is not only upwards but also yeah exponential like the last thousand years is have much more than mm -hmm. the hundred thousand years before that i guess yeah like <laughs> if you look like at the level of wealth it's it's like that <laughs> I mean, compared to like 200 years ago and not only because like people got richer but like but because like there probably wasn't that much m like there was probably no amount of money uh, like in 1702 that could buy you like a smartphone or headphones or a computer or like get you connected to the internet so like things got cheaper people got wealthier uh, and, and it didn't just happen, it was a bunch of effort, but guess what, like, if we if we did that, if, like, effort and reason and work and, like, intent to do something good, like, actually got us here, it probably can get us further. Like, it's, 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 it's what I'm kind of picking up the book is about, and, like, I'm, 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 it's, it resonates with me a lot, and I'm enjoying it. No, oh, cool. Yeah, sure. Trent is, uh, yeah, generally upwards. Yeah, he's also like making the point like that there's inequality that people complain about, uh, and he basically says like inequality is not uh, is not is not like the basic metric of like human well-being. Like it's not like food or sh food shelter or like wealth. In, in a way that, like, you have to, you know, bring home bacon and all, all that. And that inequality isn't actually that horrible. It's not, like, it's not actually that bad, like, it's not actually bad at all when it's fair, when you've earned it, and basically, it, 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 it doesn't have to, like, basically, it's not that bad as hunger, and it's basically not that bad at all, because... When it's fair, like, why, why would you care if someone has more of his, like, worked more or something? So, yeah. Yeah, right, sure. What do you think about the future of work? Do you think people have to work in the future to survive in the... Mm. At least if you look at the long term in the Western world, that uh, we are working less and less? You mean, like, when AI co comes and, like, uh, there's a bunch of automation and all that? Yeah, I mean, in like general, more, uh, nowadays there's a big discussion about basic income. Oh, uh, yeah, I've heard about it, sure. And, um, yeah, just the general concept of work. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in the Industrial rev Revolution, people had to work really hard just to survive mm -hmm. and support their families. And now, yeah, the trend is that it gets easier and easier. Mm -hmm. Do you think we still... Uh, have to work in the future well like that that's a good question um i think that as humans will definitely find something to do and if that that's not gonna be work that's gonna be something like whether like i mean like whether it's like playing video games or exploring like space and colonizing mars or something 
like I think that we'll definitely find something to do. As to whether we'll have to work, I think I think obviously when AI comes, like when there's a reliable self-driving car, truck drivers, uh, like gonna be a lot of them are gonna be other jobs. But at the same time. There will be new jobs created, but that's not what was the question. The question was, do I think whether there will be jobs and... Gosh. My intuition is that there will be jobs and we'll have to do things to survive just because you, you know, you have to kind of get the energy, get the food, but... I think, I think, okay, I mean, that's a good question, um, I mean, what are your thoughts while well, I'm kind of, you know, thinking? Yeah, I think there's a, yeah, a very big short-term challenge if you just give people money, mm -hmm. obviously, there is a part of people who are just going to be lazy and do nothing and, mm -hmm. uh, do destructive things but i think in the long term when people will get used to it it can become more benevolent i guess mm -hmm. but um i think yeah it's yeah it will be hard because yeah, like truck drivers are replaced mm -hmm. maybe people in uh, healthcare or el elderly care will mm -hmm. be replaced by ai so there's a lot of short term Yeah, there are a lot of jobs that disappear and there's also a lot of jobs maybe probably more interesting jobs that uh, are created yeah but i think in the long term if we have ai that can just do take any task mm -hmm. yeah what do we do as humans and i think it's really interesting to to think about that uh, like what i think that like like I've, I've kind of got some thoughts now, I guess, like, I've thought about it and listened to you. Um, I, I think that human beings uh, are rather good than bad, and kind of good outweighs the bad, and, like, most of us are, you know, really, really decent human beings, and really, like, rather good. So, I think that we'll adapt to whatever, you know, the income, and there will not be all that much destruction, in fact, like there might be less maybe and yeah i think that the spirit of exploration and just trying to do more isn't gonna go away and it's and i, I just can't imagine uh, even if like the environment is super comfortable i think there will still be some aspirations maybe beyond like maybe beyond just going to work but maybe something in science like there will like like, there are different AI scenarios, I mean, right? Like, there's the AI scenario where we can emerge with AI, like some people, you know, some portion of the population, are, and when, when there's like one big AGI computer. And I think that scenario where we merge with AI is likely like where we keep kind of pushing the boundaries. And that's kind of what probably resonates with me more. And like there will be probably basic income because like one person with like the brain chip or like that thing up to your ear or something will be able to do the amount of the lot of work of like a thousand or like m maybe even hundreds of thousands or millions of people uh with the intellectual power and like again like smart like the smart combinations of atoms put together aka like robotics and all that so I think I think I think I think I think the world I think we'll we'll find something to do, and I think that we'll will will likely not stop trying to explore and do more. And yeah, I, I actually think universal basic income is a good thing. I I think uh, a lot of Western countries already have like the uh, unemployment, like what it's called, like the unemployment thing that you get paid when you don't have a job. Yeah, like a welfare 
Uh, yeah, welfare probably, you know. And, and people and like and and every and everybody doesn't just stay at home and get that. Some people probably do, but not not everyone. So again, like we evolved something in us that wants us to go and explore and like care about real things. So that makes me optimistic that we'll keep pushing the boundaries, even like with AI and probably merge with it um, if everything goes right. And and if not, then probably find more exciting work, jobs to do if you know the repetitive ones are replaced. But sure, like one of the jobs will probably be just helping people to go through the process of change. So like that's probably not going to be easy. Yeah, I agree that basic income. Uh... Yeah, it's inherently a positive thing, and mm -hmm. I think it also will be inevitable yeah. in the future. But I cannot really say in what what time frame. Yeah, I have no idea how to make that prediction. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's uh, always a tricky thing to kind of try to predict things. Yeah. yeah, but like when we get to like extreme, like when we get to like a real, like, like we're like we're much more pr productive than we were three hundred years ago, and thanks to like. You know, in industrial technologies and computer science and now AI, like, we're gonna get even more productive. And when things get, like, real cheap and it's harder to kind of get a meaningful job, like, yeah, universal basic income, like, it, it's, it's good. I mean, and, and again, it, it's unclear for what kind of, what is the window, window of time when but like, like now we have AI, it's like a tool, right? It's it's not something that can be creative. So the creative window will likely be open for for another while. So. Yeah, people have really different predictions on that. Yeah, some people say like, like fifteen years, some people a hundred years, some people maybe uh, three hundred years, and uh, I couldn't really say. Yeah, me too. Maybe self-driving cars is a little more predictable. Yeah, the, I, I, I think that, mm -hmm. that they will be normal. Implemented. Yeah, yes, I, I think t uh, Tesla got already some prototypes, like with their. I mean, not just prototypes. I think they they like they already have the autopilot. Like, have you seen like some videos, like how they kind of drive themselves? I mean, yeah, the I saw it, and uh, but I. Uh, I also saw the cars, but I never really yeah. drove. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah the, the me neither. Car. But, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, we already have the technology, so it's mainly mm -hmm. a social and a regulatory thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I think in in the US, you kind of <laughs> you you kind of have to still keep your hands on the wheel, even though like the car drives itself, just because like the the law and. All. Or, yeah. or, or staff. So I'm sure, there's still a lot of challenges, but uh, yeah, the technology is there. So now we have to really make sure that it is safe and that it is dependable. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main challenge. But yeah, I think the ways of development when the world kind of gets closer and when and when like there is. Uh, not necessarily less inequality, but but when when there's less of like extreme bad conditions of poverty and hunger and disease, and like again, when the world gets closer and leverages technology for good, I think that's that's a good future, and I think that you know, uh, I, I I think that what that's what human beings have been doing before, and that's what we could con continue on doing probably. No. And it's mainly up to the to the people, right? Like artificial yeah, intelligence sure. technology in itself that yeah, does not have an opinion or a part or positive or negative side, but we yeah, we have to use it for good to Yeah. Yeah. But it can also be used for bad, so Yeah. It's up to um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's not cool. Afghan, let's see. Do you have any uh, topics you still want to talk about? I don't know how long we've been talking. Or... Uh, I, I actually do. I have like a timer here. It's two hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah. And that was actually 
great and I enjoyed it a lot and I think that now it's about the time to wrap up because it's such a inspiring positive note that I'm probably probably not gonna sleep for another 45 minutes but then I call him blackout anyway because it's uh 2 2:30 in the morning <laughs> okay cool so yeah maybe, maybe a short uh thing about uh ai dot io Did you? yeah I, I checked it out Check yeah. it out. Yeah, I was it useful to you? Mm. you? Could you use it? Was it useful to you? Do you have any uh, comments or feedback on the website? Uh, um, I, I would like like the, the way the way like I saw it is that like there was videos on on the on the site that from YouTube. I mean, do, do you guys like manually find out uh, AI content and place it there? There's yeah. mainly videos about uh, AI. Yeah, AI. And also mm -hmm. YouTube, but it's and, also and, like. And, and the courses and articles, right? You have. Yeah, that. like general resources for papers and courses. And, uh, yeah. I just mm -hmm. saw the question a lot for how do I get started in machine learning? Mm -hmm. And uh, AI people ask that a lot. So that was my main motivation for the website to answer that question. Like, how do I get. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, yeah, like a portal for. <laughs> Is it is it yeah. is it uh, your w w website? Yeah, I built it from uh, ah, okay. WordPress. Okay, it was confusing to me because I, I thought you were an admin, and I thought like it was some somebody else else whom you were managing. But like, yeah, I mean, I mean that that's even cooler now because like the website is cool and like you made it. Mm. Okay, but well, it's good I, to I know I, that. I, I don't know if you have like maybe I mean I haven't checked that that thoroughly, but do you put out like. Uh, you know, Saraj Rebel does that kind of study plans for kind of how do you get started? Like you learn feed forward neurons and convolutional, then like recurrent. Like do do you do that sort of thing? Yeah, like the curriculums I did. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, curriculum. Uh, exactly. Learn machine learning in two, uh, three months. Mm -hmm. I did that, and I wrote a blog post about it every week. Mm -hmm. Like the topic. But yeah, that's a good idea to to create some. Uh, some general curriculums mm -hmm. instead of only listing the the course uh, links. Yeah, I I, I googled the AI tube. Now I'm gonna share. Okay. Yeah. So what I found cool is that I can kind of come come here and you know there's AI videos like 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 um uh, th th this one's probably the best one of them. <laughs> Like, the best one. like this one stands out, and I can kind of say that like that that one is good, but other others are, are also pretty pretty nice. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay, test uh, something for me, by the way. If you um, type in Ivan in the search mm -hmm. bar, see if you get your videos. Then yeah, you get. Uh, oh, there I am. There I am. The, the, that's that's me to, to that's me tomorrow in the tomorrow m morning <laughs> or something. Okay, I'm not sure why that comes up. I mean, there may be some researcher in the description that you know was uh, contributing to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, facts, so I, I mean, I mean, I mean, it'd be cool if there, I don't know, kind of. You know, the, the, there's some amount of friction that involved to like go to the site and check it. So, it, so you kind of you're much likely to just scroll through YouTube. But maybe, I mean, do you do like some AI tube Twitter account or something like that? Like you, you could probably like do a bot or something, so that yeah, it's, was, it's more direct. Yeah, I was thinking about making more uh, original. Context. Original, co yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great idea. So maybe do like live coding streams or even uh, interviews. Yeah. Yeah. I think about I, that, I, that. I, I heard doing interviews is cool. I, somebody told me that some while ago. Uh, yeah, I think it's great what you're doing. Like, uh, and uh, yeah, I also really like the format, like podcasts that. Sometimes just go on like three and a half hours. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, uh, uh, do you listen listening. to uh, Joe Rogan's podcast? Have you checked that? Uh, the no, the, <laughs> I, I sometimes say no when it's like the Russian word for like um. But anyways, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I I was just saying that I also like the like long podcast, so I I don't mind talking for long and I don't know. I th I, th I think that even if just I mean even if like nobody gets to the end, I mean we've gotten to the end and maybe and I I find it cool and useful and hopefully you did too. So that's yeah, what I, I find it really cool. Yeah, I've never done something like this uh, before. Like uh, me, me neither. <laughs> Just a long, uh, long kind of interview discussion from it. So now yeah. I really like it. Y yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It kind of lets you. It, it kind of give you that some of that like interview format and discussion. And you're also like learning a lot. And you're, you, 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 I don't know. I think that interaction is super cool. Yeah, yeah sure. Do you have people do you, that you do want to interview after this? I'll, I'll, I'll probably. I mean, do you know people that I may want to get in touch with? Yeah, I know some interesting people, and I also think they are they're easily approachable through yeah. Twitter. Mm -hmm. One is uh, Bril Simacek. Mm -hmm. He's an, uh, uh, the dean of uh, School of AI Enschede mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. She's doing research on uh, it's, medical it, images. It's from the school of AI where, like, where you went to. Yeah, and I also went to mm, Antwerp cool. in uh, Belgium. Mm -hmm. How was that? It, yeah, it was also really mm -hmm. cool. It was uh, set up a bit uh, bigger, more in uh, mm -hmm. cooperation with the university. So they had an opening event with 200 mm -hmm. people and a reception. And they are also doing more like um, expert sessions and beginner sessions. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Enske Day is more like an informal session where you go with 30 or 40 people and you network and discuss uh, different topics. Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. also the guy in uh, in Antwerp, and the Stick Bosmans, mm -hmm. it's called. I think you would also really be very interesting. To, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think <laughs> I, th I think you'll you'll text me the names later so that you know I I I I, I, I don't get super depressed about my. Uh, uh, about my, you know, writing of foreign names or something. Yeah, yeah but... Well, maybe yeah. you should write as well. Right? Yeah. Maybe you can introduce I, I actually, th I've actually thought about it. I mean, but like, I thought, it like, m maybe at some point that would be cool. Yeah, I, I mean, that would definitely be tremendous. But, but like, but like, even this format, like, for me, probably, like, each conversation is, 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 is I don't know. I mean, Put me with Sarash, put me with like anybody. Like I I'm here and it's 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 not like it's not necessarily how famous a person is like you you to like have a good conversation, you know? Cause I, I think, no. cause I think like we've had a good one over like the three hours. Yeah. Yeah, no. so so you've just given me three people. Uh, the best I had was to like go and uh, ask people around on Twitter. Well, I guess I'll do that too. <laughs> but I'll check out the guys that you've shared, and I will tell. Yeah, and I will tell them that you've sent me. So <laughs> there's okay. there. So there is no coming back from that point. Huh? I just say yeah. This is guy from Siberia who contacted. <laughs> <laughs> This is the guy from Siberia who stays up late and interviews <laughs> people <laughs> on, on AI late at night for three hours on Skype. Oh, who's got a little sister who sometimes gets the screen. Oh my god. Very interesting. <laughs> that, that, sure. that is the future of podcasting. In, in 71 year, everybody's doing that. Everybody will be podcasting, podcasting nonstop. Yeah, th th there will be like a, a, a skyscraper in Siberia where people from all around the wo world will go and like do their podcast, and they will have <laughs> uh, the same the same backgrounds. Like they will have like chroma keys, uh, like with this background or something. But, but yeah, I mean, on a serious yeah. note, yeah, I mean, podcasts are, are, are I don't know they're great, <laughs> and, and 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 it's actually like. If you, if you ask somebody like let's go and chat for three hours on Skype, uh, it's kind of I mean it's kind it's kind of easier to ask people that you don't know much like hey let, let's go get interviewed because now it kind of feels like there's there are like other people who might be listening and watching so it's not that awkward so 
that part helps. Yeah, it sounds a lot more weird if you say like, do you want to talk three hours with me about AI and all yeah. kinds of stuff? Then just say, do you want to do a podcast? Yeah. Because I, do yeah, I couldn't stuff? imagine this mm -hmm. would, yeah, we would just go, go on talking for three hours. I would yeah. just maybe an hour or something. Yeah, so I, I actually thing. think we could. Just happens. I, I have like had long Skype conversations, but yeah, I think I think kind of the fact that it's it's been recorded kind of kind of forces some useful thoughts and kind of keeps you maybe uh, up to the mark, and, and it definitely helps like from both sides to keep going. So that's definitely useful. Yeah, hopefully it will inspire other people as well, or they may learn something from it. Yes. <laughs> Point, I guess, for a podcast. Oh, I, I, honestly, like the, I honestly don't know how many people would get to the end, but 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 I, I'm gonna probably cut some maybe cool moments and upload them on Twitter or maybe something. Time oh, sorry? Huh? Maybe timestamps? Yeah, ta also? yeah, definitely. The topic definitely. Yeah, definitely. I would do timestamps and I would do like short clips. And maybe someone would watch short clip clips and get get interested. Uh, whether it's like in go and listen to the full version or just go and like doing something of their own because that's cool oh, or, yeah, that's or, 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 or or just you know co coming here yeah because you're already doing that with your videos right yeah yeah, yeah 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 for for your series yeah because <laughs> like yeah i mean I, I i i gotta show that like i i i have something to show when i can like speak english or something and I have a webcam and some video editing. I think that kind of catches the eye and maybe more entertaining and easier to follow. Yeah. Ah, cool. Okay, I think we've. Uh, yeah, I think I think I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Like, I, I, I want to just virtually like uh, uh, shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it works uh, quite yeah, well. Yeah, it actually works quite well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let, let's do the pistol thing. Yeah. No, the camera is here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got this, my man. Okay. Well, I want to wish you good luck with the podcast, and I really think it's great Thanks. what you're doing. Because Thanks. I don't think they are that many AI podcasts. It is Lex Friedman, who has a really good podcast from nvidia uh, lex friedman is a researcher at mit so oh, I okay I, i've listened to like some guy from nvidia on ai but yeah oh, I, I, I think I'm yeah like, and like uh, I, i'm also like clearly doing that for myself to kind of talk and learn and all that and try to put out some useful content out there yeah so sure it was my big, big pleasure, Carlo. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I, I, I wish you, you know, all the luck with your university and your projects. And I, I really hope that, you know, you get to build some good artificial general intelligence machines in the future. Yeah, that's the goal. So we'll just keep on working and uh, yeah. okay. keep on going. Okay, so I guess that'll be less weird if we'll like right now say goodbye. I'll yeah. turn off the recording and then we'll like say another goodbye and then like it, <laughs> it and then like it, it has a chance of like ending because okay. I think now is the right time to end. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, I'm doing OBS now. It's just you know, I think that'll be cool. Say goodbye in Dutch. Are you recording? Yeah, not now I do. Okay. Tot ziens, Ivan. Spreek je later. Ja, yeah, that was great. I, cool. And and now you can also say the Polish uh, and Russian cheer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't remember it. Sorry. Nazdarovia. Yeah, Nazdarovia, but uh, like, uh, hello, how is it going in Russian? Ah, I don't remember. Привет, как дела? Привет, привет. Как дела? Как дела? Как дела is how are you? Как дела? Как как дела? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
really not used to the pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. I'll check some things out. Okay. Yeah, it's quite different. So okay, like and now now it's like the real goodbye. Bye, bye guys. Bye.